So we now have a panel that's going to be moderated by Harlan Krumholtz. Um, Harlan is a professor at Yale. He's the editor of Circulation Outcomes. He's a cardiologist. He's on the board of uh, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, he's an incredibly accomplished uh, clinician as well as researcher, and we're delighted to have him here. Thanks, Vikas. It's an immense pleasure and privilege to be part of this dialogue and to participate with each of you. What a diverse group you've assembled and what an important charge you've given. I just wanted to reflect on a few a few things, and then we'll call up this uh, remarkable panel and, and I think have further this conversation. Um, thank you, Shannon, also. It's really wonderful to be here. Appreciate the invitation. You know, I was thinking about um, a conversation I had with a with a hospital administrator, leader, and actually made me think about what the most remarkable thing was about George Washington. The, um, what is the most remarkable thing about George Washington? Yeah, he didn't want to become king. I, I thought about that because I thought like he was willing to retire to his farm in Virginia after two terms. He was willing to think about the system in a bigger sense. He was willing to say, my job is not to continue my own power, but my job is to think about what the future of the republic was going to be. In this conversation with the hospital administrator, I suggested that, that maybe our goal was in 10 years to have half as many beds, to have half as large a budget for in-hospital care. And, and you, you know how well this was received? <laughs> But it's kind of a remarkable thing if you think about it, because what's that person's job, really? Is it about consolidating the power of that institution? Is it about, in perpetuity, ensuring that that institution remains large and vibrant, able to pay salaries and provide jobs? That's a, that is an admirable piece. But what's its core mission, and what is it really intended to do? And it made me think, even as taught as a medical student, I mean, what's my job as a cardiologist? I mean. Isn't my job to put myself out of business? Isn't my job to think about wise care and healing for my patients? I mean, it's not the way it was set up. It was not the context which I was given. One of the most powerful things I think about this conference and the kind of talks that we have is our ability to reflect on the culture that we've created and to think about what that path forward is going to be because the context so importantly shapes the way that we act and the things that we do. The, um, the context for me about this conference, although the overuse piece is extraordinarily important and it takes quite a lot of courage to bring it out front and center, but I do think that the path for us with the narrative is around the right healthcare, around a healing and learning healthcare system, about one that's truly responsive to the patient's needs. And by the way, our focus on waste is on this disabling increase in the amount of our resources that are being spent, the opportunity costs that are imposed upon us, the other investments that are not made. But you know, this waste also takes a great toll on patients. And, and in the direct way that we're gonna talk about is one thing, but I'm talking about the wasted time, effort, worry, anxiety, all those indirect costs that are never completely accounted for that have to do with the way in which the system currently functions. And this gets to Don's area of about the way the processes are set in place. I mean, we should be thinking about waste in every opportunity, in every nook and cranny that we find, and be steadfastly devoted toward making it better. I think about myself on the consult, consult uh, rotation. Do you know that we actually don't tell patients when we're going to come by to see them? I know that's hard to believe. None of you can believe that. <laughs> we get a consult, and you know, we come by when we can. So that means a patient is sitting in a hospital bed wondering, when will that cardiology consult come by my bed? My family's here. Will they miss that person? What if I go for a walk? What if I'm taken to a test? That level of anxiety that exists throughout the day is never addressed. And we may come by at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock. We'll come in when it gets fit in. And where's the reflection on what kind of imposition? That brings what the waste of emotion, the waste of anxiety, the waste of time with lack of coordination. Where are we 
committing ourselves to thinking about this in terms of actually elevating the healthcare system in every dimension. And that's why I think the path here is, of course, paying attention to wise stewardship of resources, but being, like I said, steadfastly devoted toward ridding waste, every kind of waste, every kind of unnecessary waste and harm that's generated throughout our system as a result of the fact that it emerged as a very profession-centric design, one intended to serve our needs, but not always attentive to the needs of patients. I just on a couple of other quick notes, I think that, that some of what emerges also out of this is the way in which we think about things and the way in which we're able to convey and communicate. And this, this discordance between a, an education that was steeped in mechanism and our idea that we know that if there's a clogged artery, it must be opened that we know, we think we know how everything works. But then actually in the studies that are conducted, we often find results that are, in our minds, paradoxical, unexpected, surprising, and recognize that yet at the same time, we've been so steeped in this idea that we should know what works, that we want to continue to pursue courses that have long since been shown not to be beneficial. And we haven't created, again, a learning healthcare system where we are learning from the experience of everyone who comes through and then funneling that back into informed decisions that are made next. We're not taking into account the probabilistic nature of a lot of the decisions that are made and trying to gain the perspective of what is really, where, where is there actually no chance? Where is there some chance? How can we put those in terms that people can understand? How can we ensure that there are high quality decisions that are being made? Where does that work in to the system? And I think we have to admit, and as Don says, a commenter said, this is not about deprivation. I think this is about augmentation of resources. This is about choosing among the different choices in ways that are most aligned with the patient's preferences, values, and goals. I think these high quality decisions start by making, changing the board exams. I'm on the American Board of Internal Medicine, and a lot of my discussion has been with them We've got to change the way these questions are oriented. So many of them are suggested that there's a right answer. Patient looks like this. What should they do? What should happen? Without any sense that you would never know what the right thing to do is if you've never talked to the person, that I can know with a small vignette what the right answer is, is, is a symptomatic of the culture that we've created whereby we can bypass the patient and we can impose our wills with regard to the choices and preferences. With regard to this uh, idea, I mean, we need to be able to say there can be two patients identical with regard to risks, identical with regard to benefits, or identical with regard to options. They may choose two different courses and both be right. That it's up to us to set the plate and to do so honestly and forthright in a forthright way and to be honest about the uncertainty. It's true that uncertainty is scary. It's true that we often feel the patients want to hear the right answer. But when there is no right answer, we need to know what the script is to be able to navigate the difficult conversations about trying to help people make the best choices for themselves. We aren't trained in that. No one gave me that script. I had to watch people, some who I thought did it better than others, but it's not an integral part of our curriculum. It's not an integral part of our training. It finds no place within our grand rounds or within our teaching. It's not valued anywhere within the profession. No one gets promoted for doing right. it well. It's a big problem within medicine. And this kind of I'm, conference I'm can begin this dialogue in this discussion that can, I believe, start moving us forward. With that, I wanna say that I am extremely honored to be uh, with this remarkable panel. And uh, for you to be able to assemble this group of wise individuals uh, is quite amazing. And uh, so let me, with no further ado, introduce the people that we have here with us and get this conversation started. I think one thing that uh, is obvious to me is your, your willingness, your eagerness to include the patient perspective, to include yeah. The idea no, that we I'm need to be hearing from, from people who, who see the healthcare profession in a different way. I, I, the one piece for me is that um, 
it's amazing when we as healthcare professionals, those of you who are in the room who are healthcare professionals, become patients or have a loved one who's a patient, how all of a sudden we can see things that we can't see otherwise. The degree to which the filters are on our eyes as we go through our daily uh, work, that makes it impossible for us to perceive even the very simplest of opportunities to make things better, even the simplest of harms that are occurring that we can see differently. By bringing people on the panel who have that perspective, first and foremost, we will be benefited. So let me introduce um, first uh, Jesse Grumman, who was unable to be here with us today, but is on Skype and will be joining us. And I see, I can see her on the laptop, and I know that we'll be able to post her up. Jesse is the president and founder Thanks. of the Center for Advancing Health. Um, mm -hmm. But let me say, having read her book, uh, Aftershock, I, first I strongly recommend this book to you. She spent time in writing this book interviewing uh, hundreds of patients. And the wisdom embedded in this, the, the idea that we can't just solve this by throwing information at people, the idea that she herself was a reluctant consumer of information, even as she is a national leader uh, for, as a patient advocate, um, is really a, a, an amazing thing. And I, I, Jesse, I want to tell you, the, the quotes and the way in which you, you wove that in, your combining of your professional expertise uh, and your training in qualitative methods and your perspective as a patient was really wonderful. And uh, it's something I think that should be required reading for medical students and physicians. So Jesse's going to join us by Skype. Uh, Ranjana Srivastana, Srivastava. Rajana, you can tell me. Why don't you come on down? Rivastava. Why didn't I ask her before? Thank you. <laughs> Is um, an oncologist from uh, Australia and also the author of two remarkable books. She is a skilled storyteller and someone who is a keen observer. And from the time I think that her grandmother uh, contracted cancer has been taking in the, the lessons of her patients and of loved ones uh, with this and has authored uh, Tell Me the Truth, Conversations with My Patients About Life and Death, an award-winning uh, book, and also a book also from Penguin on Dying for a Chat. Two books that I also uh, highly recommend in, in preparation for this, had the pleasure of reading and uh, are uh, quite insightful. And please uh, come up and, and join us. Uh, Becky Spielman uh, is joining us also to tell us uh, her perspective as a registered nurse who resides in Greensboro, North Carolina with her family. And uh, Becky, um, would you come on? You guys can come on, take seats. Uh, Maureen Corey is Executive Director of Childbirth Connection and a board member of the National Quality Forum, Forum uh, and someone who received her MPH from Yale. Um, and uh, is very welcome and has a wide-ranging perspective on how to improve healthcare and the kind of areas that we can leverage in order to make a difference. Um, Katie Butler uh, is a journalist, uh, is someone who I first became familiar with uh, through her piece in the New York Times and then subsequently through her book, uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door. Again, uh, um, a journalist, a writer. Uh, this person is one of another skilled storyteller who is able, I think, through her narrative to give us a perspective on people's lives uh, and the, the importance of the task at hand for today. Uh, in a way that's very rare. And I, when I tell you I recommend their books, I'm not doing it uh, either to ingratiate myself to our panelists or uh, just to say it as a matter of fact because I'm moderating this panel. These are all very powerful, very powerful books that tell important stories. And I think if we're to win at the task that uh, Shannon and Vikas have set forth for us, it's not going to be on the statistics. We're going to need to be telling stories, and we're going to need to be telling real and authentic and genuine stories that move us and that push us to action and think about medicine in a different way. And um, finally, Diane Meyer is director of the Center for, uh, to Advance Palliative Care at Mount Sinai, past recipient of MacArthur Foundation's uh, award, and uh, one of the people who inspires me by her message and approach and caring, and uh, although I've never had the privilege of working directly with Diane, I have students who have, and I know the, the, the power of her healing and her sensitivity 
to the needs of patients. So um, this remarkable group, we will be going through a, a series of dialogues, uh, allowing uh, one person to start, uh, another person to respond, and then to have some uh, patient participation and discussion. Uh, Jesse is going to uh, start, and then uh, uh, Ranjana, you're going to, to, to tee off on her uh, points, and then we'll have some audience discussion before going on to the next group. I uh, want to welcome the group very warmly. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so privileged to be part of this. And uh, Jesse, are you ready? Uh, we uh, look forward to your talk and appreciate that you're willing to, to reach us from afar. Sure. Thanks. Can you, you hear me? Um, yes. Hello? Yes, we, we can you hear can. you. You can. Okay, good. I don't have... We can't see you yet. Okay. But uh, I'm sure there's... Ah, yes. Around. There's the, that seeking part. <laughs> you can't see the faces you're making at us, but... Right. <laughs> Should I begin or are we going to try to reconnect? Let's try one second here to see if we can... Um, The video needs to be on. Uh... Well, maybe that means she can see us. There we go. Hello. We're, we're just still. OK, let's just go, Jesse. We'll, we'll listen intently to your. Uh... OK, that, that's much better. That's much, much more comfortable for me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Sorry I can't be there in person. There's so many of you who I would like to see. I was looking forward to seeing you. But those of you who um, have had experience with this know about the, the tyranny of the chemotherapy appointment and how rarely that and, and for how few purposes that actually gets moved. So this afternoon, I'll be going to chemotherapy instead of hanging out with you guys, unfortunately. Uh, Vikas asked me to uh, tell a short story that uh, would uh, muddy the waters a little, would give us give you uh, some jumping off places to uh, think about um, this whole issue of right-sizing care. Um, and so here is my little story. Uh, in March this past year, I was diagnosed with my fifth primary cancer, uh, metastatic lung cancer. I hadn't been feeling good for about four or five months, and uh, oftentimes it takes a while to, to diagnose uh, lung cancer and for me to distinguish it from my other cancers. Uh, and so I finally got a diagnosis, and I, I went in to meet my new uh, thoracic oncologist, um, and we had a, he was very genial, very kind of forthcoming. And, and uh, we talked, chit-chatted, my husband and I chit-chatted with him for probably three or four minutes. And then he said, you know, um, we're not going to do any treatment at all. We're not going to do any chemotherapy or anything. We're just going to make sure that you're comfortable over the next few months. Uh, and our first response was, oh, that's that's so lovely. Nobody's trying to overtreat me. I had had, uh, with my, my, my gastric cancer, I had a, an, an unfortunate experience with, with chemotherapy, and I didn't mind not getting any more, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and I thought that this was a really humane and generous way to kind of greet me into this practice. So, so we left our appointment feeling good and uh, went home and we started reading and talking to people, um, reading more widely and talking more widely to people. And um, gosh, you know, we realized that the, the first line chemotherapy, which is pretty normal um, for people with metastatic lung cancer to get, um, um, is effective in about 20% of the cases. Not only that, it's you know it's kind of a gateway. If you you can't get onto clinical trials and you can't get uh, experimental drugs unless you have first tried first line chemotherapy. So so my husband and I go back for our second appointment and I say, you know, I would like to try chemotherapy, and his response was, no. Say what? No, I I I can't recommend that. I don't think that's a good idea for you. Um, and um, that was the end of that discussion. We were kind, we were nonplussed, you know. And and we we walked away and we kind of like, what what attribution can we make to that no? 
And my first attribution was, of, of course, a, a generous one, because I, I don't attribute ill will to my clinician. I thought, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the evidence of, you know, with my complicated history and my complicated um, and my, you know, my many experiences with chemotherapy uh, mean that it's just it's, it, it's too much for me. And, and in, in his clinical experience, it's just the wrong thing for me. And he's making a very strong recommendation to me that I should just like back off this whole notion of chemotherapy and go ahead with whatever comes next. My second attribution was slightly less generous. Um, and it was that kind of he's, I felt like maybe he'd just seen this too often. He knew maybe I'd get a couple extra months if I got chemotherapy, um, but that it really wasn't, you know, I was going to suffer and it really wasn't worth his time to watch me go through this. He kind of, I kind of felt like he, he wrote me off and thought that this would actually be a waste of time and resources. But, you know, I really, I really decided I wanted to try. I wanted to know if I was part of the 20% who could be helped by chemotherapy. And the fact that I'd struggled with chemotherapy before was kind of irrelevant to me. You know, I, I, it, 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 these were different drugs. I wondered if maybe I could ramp up and see how I tolerated a, a smaller dose. Um, so after a lot of discussion uh, with my husband, really agonized discussion, uh, because I didn't want to be somebody who just shopped doctors, you know, to, to give me the treatment that I wanted. Eventually, we changed doc I changed doctors. I found someone who, you know, thought that we should be making those kind of decisions together. So, um, and that's my story. Um, and I have, I have three reflections. I'm sure you have uh, other responses to this kind of thing, but I have three main reflections. The first is, whose decision is this anyway? You know, it's not like I was asking for uh, an experimental drug or to, to be made an exception of, to be part of a clinical trial. You know, I, I, I was just looking for what most people with my diagnosis at my stage would kind of routinely be given. Um, I was going to be the one who took the risk. I was going to be the one who got any benefit that was conferred, and I just didn't—I didn't quite understand why I was cut out of the decision um, at all. Um, my second reflection <laughs> was uh, is on how very difficult it was for my husband and I to come to this, to the to make the choice to leave this um, doctor and and actually to challenge him. Um, my husband's on the faculty at the at Colum on the Columbia uh, University Medical School. I have spent since I was twenty uh, trying to figure out how to find good health care and make the most of it. I'm not intimidated by doctors. My husband is not intimidated by doctors. Uh, but the two of us were just like, you know, can, have we communicated the wrong way? Should we use fax instead of email? Um, should I talk instead of my husband talking? You know, did, did were we presumptuous in saying that? We were just all over ourselves trying to figure out how we had contributed to this situation where we felt like we were not part of the kind of part of the action. It was just so very odd. And, you know, the thing, you can make all sorts of attributions to our personalities. Um, retiring would not be one, I would say, though. Um, but um, uh, the thing that really kind of, kind of gets me about this is that um, we are really educated and really confident, and we have a lot of resources, and we have a lot of friends in the medical field, and we were just so, um, we found this so difficult. This was such a struggle for us to make this challenge and make this change. What must it be like for people who know less and have less? What do they do? How do they, how do they manage this? What, what has been set up that allows this kind of barrier, this kind of intimidation to really infect and so badly influence a, a, a 
a decision that should be part of um, a discussion that's shared between the people who are, have something at stake. It was just such an odd, it was such an <laughs> it was an odd situation in the first place, but the the um, the difficulty that we had in making this decision just staggered me. It was just amazing. And then uh, my third reflection was uh, uh, actually it was just a small piece of the whole interaction, but since that time it it's been repeated a couple times with new clinicians and I, it seems to be a trend and I just wanted to mention it. And that was that, that this, this thoracic oncologist came in and he chit-chatted a little bit and then he kind of told us what the plan was going to be. Um, he didn't talk to me about what my thoughts are or what I knew or did I understand whether I had lung cancer or not. I mean, there was nothing. You know, he was just, um, he had he had a plan for me. Uh, a, a few weeks after this, I went to a palliative care doctor to help me with my eating because uh, I was losing weight. And uh, I went in to the appointment and I, to the consult and I sat down and uh, he had been told by my referring um, survivorship doctor that I needed help on eating. So he started reciting the statistics on, you know, what they know about eating and cancer and, and weight gain and weight loss and all this kind of stuff. And three times in the course of this hour long consultation, he said, the single most important thing you can do is dramatically increase your cardiovascular fitness. And each time I said, excuse me, sir, I have lung cancer. I can't breathe which did not stop him from saying the same thing two more times after that. He was like, come on, buddy. Like, do you have a button besides transmit? You have no receive function in that thing you got going over there? It was just amazing. I mean, and this has happened a couple of other times. And I'm just, I was like, what is going on here? Am I not part of this program that we have, like, that we're working on? Is this not a mutual project that we have, that we're, that we're kind of trying, a, a mutual problem that we're trying to solve? Don't I have a voice here? So those are my three reflections on my little story. I'm sure you have more. Maybe we can get, um, well, you don't care if you see me, so. Um, uh, but I'm happy to participate in the discussion as we go along. I hope I'm able to hear you as well. Uh, Thank you, Jesse. I, I mean, it's a painful story to hear because it reflects the health system that we're all a part of. And I, I thank you so much for sharing it. And uh, we share your outrage. I just can tell you that you're in solidarity with everyone here who felt the same, uh, I'm sure, the same way. Ranjana, what, what do you think? Uh, and good morning, everyone. I'm cringing in my seat as I hear Jesse's story. Um, I'm from Australia and I quickly wanted to tell you a little bit about our universal health care system, which, which we do have. So we have Obamacare and, and more. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and we can talk more about that later. But, but the points I wanted to make in terms of uh, oncology or any other medical practice is A, neither the doctor nor the patient is aware of any cost in medicine, which is an interesting, uh, which is an interesting thing. So, so for example, um, if I wanted to treat Jesse with, with whatever drug was available through our pharmaceutical benefits scheme, there was no insurance who would question me, um, the patient doesn't get a bill, and so it has all sorts of implications about access to, to treatment. The first point that I, wanted to, um, that I wanted to comment on about Jesse is that Jesse is no ordinary patient. She is a highly empowered, highly educated patient with an equally uh, intellectual husband. And, and it's really worth reflecting that if she has this terrible experience with the healthcare system, I mean, if you were to pick the kind of patient who should be able to speak up to doctors, speak up to medical hierarchy, get what she wants, perhaps understand more of the medical literature than the average person off the street does, she would be the patient. And so it's, it's just, shocking and astonishing, but in some ways, not so really, that she has had such, a, such an experience with the, prefer, with the medical profession. And, and it should really highlight to us, it highlights to me how much more the 
the average patient must suffer. Jesse brought up an interesting point about chemotherapy in metastatic lung cancer, which, you know, unfortunately, although we have made gains, the gains are nowhere near what we would like to see. So for most patients um, with advanced lung cancer, the question really is to how to protect them, if, if I could be so presumptuous, from overtreatment and to prevent them from having chemotherapy. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about how, you, how I navigate that line and how difficult I find it. Because there is no insurance system, because there is no, and there is a real sense of entitlement, I think, that comes with having pride in a universal healthcare system. The, the ordinary patient who comes to me with metastatic lung cancer looking very unwell, I work in a, in a particularly impoverished area of town um, where people look 10 or 20 years older than, than their stated age. And I look at them and my heart sinks and I know that they, they have a short life expectancy. But everybody wishes to have chemotherapy. Everyone wants to have chemo because it's what you do when you have cancer. And everyone comes in with the story of their neighbor's son's friend's friend who survived with a miracle treatment. And you know, where is that treatment? Why can't I have it? Um, so to, so to talk to, to patients about the limited benefits of chemotherapy, but still not make them feel excluded from care, I think is, is kind of the new challenge that I find in oncology. Because, you know, treatments have advanced to the extent that you can literally treat a patient until the day they die. I mean, oncology has reached a stage where you don't have to say, I don't have anything for you. You really don't. You can just keep giving people things that, that, don't, that don't work or have a, you know, have a very little small success rate. And, and I find that, that from the beginning, it's, it's really important to listen to patients' expectations. Um, and, and try to avoid this uh, sort of the supermarket scenario, you know, which cereal would you like? You know, it's your life, what chemo would you like? Or what, what can I give you? And, and so on. The, the, the biggest problems that I find teaching our junior faculty and teaching our residents is how to have those conversations and, and perhaps more fundamentally that these conversations are important. Um, and, 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 you know, I do feel I, th I think there is such a discrepancy these days. There are the doctors who, th there seem to be two kinds of doctors. The doctors who take time to talk to their patients and the doctors who prescribe chemotherapy and the sort of the hardcore oncologists. And, and you know, unfortunately, I think that the, the, the perception even, even amongst the medical profession is that somehow uh, learning about the art of medicine is an optional extra. And what you need to do is you need to know your facts and statistics, and you need to know how to run down the line of chemotherapies to prescribe. And it doesn't, you know, somehow taking time is, well, you know, optional. And, and what I have found in, in my practice is, sure, a lot of people will say that to really try to, to, to distinguish patients' expectations and deal with, you know, what grandma wants for the patient and what the husband wants and the son and the daughter, it all takes too much time and there's a waiting room full of patients. It's a public health care system. The patients are just flooding through. There is just not the time. But I don't buy that. And, and I think increasingly, I have become really vocal with my residents and, and, and junior staff about the fact that we shouldn't buy that argument. Because what I have found is that once you take time to explore their initial motivations and expectations and lay the groundwork with a good conversation that probably does take a little bit more time than the average consult. The future consults are easier, they're smoother. The transition from active management to palliative care is, is far less um, onerous. And I think patients feel included. Um, that's kind of my view. I'd like to hear what, what you think, and I'm sure we will in the discussion. And I wanted to leave you with, with something that, um, that I found very poignant and quite telling. Um, about 30 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Franz Inglefinger, who used to be one of the editors of the New England, published a post uh, the New England published a posthumous essay. 
Um, Dr. Inglefinger, as I understand it, was a gastroenterology specialist, uh, especially um, concentrating on diseases of the esophagus. And he was uh, tragically afflicted by, by cancer of the gastroesophageal junction. He had, very, he had successful surgery. I mean, I, I suppose he had no lack of experts to, to tap into. He had successful surgery. And unfortunately, in the surgical specimen, some micrometastases were found. Now, we don't really know in oncology what to do with micrometastases. I mean, they've been resected. Are they a harbinger of future metastatic disease? Or can you say that because you cured the disease or you picked it up at an early stage that you're OK? So the next question for him was whether to follow up with adjuvant chemotherapy, which is, which is highly toxic, and also whether to have adjuvant radiotherapy, which to that area of the body is also very, very taxing. And I'd encourage you to read his essay, which is, uh, which is called Arrogance. Um, and it talked about the difficulties that this eminent physician, who had a family full of physicians, had in making these decisions because he was overwhelmed by well-intentioned advice, but it was so sort of disparate. And this is what he wrote. So he wrote of his growing confusion and emotional distress, as well as his medically trained families, at the well-intentioned but conflicting barrage of information coming from the top experts in the field about whether he should undergo chemotherapy or radiotherapy. This is the bit that, that I like. This is what he says. Finally, when the pangs of indecision became intolerable, one wise physician friend said, you know, what you need is a doctor. <laughs> he was telling me to forget the information I already had and to seek instead a person who would tell me what to do, who would assume responsibility for my care. When that excellent advice was followed, my family and I sensed immediate and immense relief. Now that tells us something, and I think what it, what it says is that even in this age of miraculous and marvelous medical technology and medicines and unending lists of drugs and chemotherapy, the average patient still expects us to assume some form of responsibility for their care. And I think abandoning that and to treat medicine as if it's, a, you know, it's, it's just a menu of choices is somehow shirking our responsibility as a physician. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to open it up to some audience discussion. But Jesse, I, I just wonder, I just want to pull out this kind of tension between what we've just heard from Franz Inglefinger's essay and the experience that you have, because it, there is this, this hope. Uh, you write about it in your book, that someone's going to walk in and just tell you what to do and, and help you through that uh, bad news and to, to help you know, everything be right, but that that's not how you think the real world operates. So actually, I just want to pull out this tension between what I just heard, which was this idea that I just wish someone would take over for me and make, you know, make those choices in what I heard from you, Jesse, and what way I've been sort of thinking about with regard to shared decision making. One last thing is what Don said, which is the healthcare system in some way creates the expectations for patients. And we don't provide a pathway where you can do both. You can still be that caring, engaged, guiding physician, but you're doing it through the elicitation of preferences and values. And, and that's not quite what, we're hearing from Franz, so I think was perplexed, as you read it, with the choices they had. So Jesse, I, I just wonder if you could give us a response, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for comments. Sure, you know, um, I think one of, one of the things that is really clear to me is that at different times uh, in the course of an illness, I have different expectations and different for my physician to take on those roles. And, and I, you know, I, I am in awe of this very notion that we expect physicians to not only play these very different roles, but to intuit when we need them to play those very different roles. You know, when I, if, if I walk in today and I'm just feeling horrible and I need some relief, I don't want, you know, a menu of options.
options. I want, you know, my, my doctor to say, you know, the, the most, the thing that we usually do when somebody's in this situation is this. How about if we do that? And I don't want to, I don't want to go home and look stuff up online, but you know, when I'm feeling okay and I'm feeling like I'm making a decision that, that really in, could influence the course of my disease, I want to have a role and I want my physician to be able to meet me halfway or meet me wherever I am. So I'm in awe of physicians who are able to do that. I don't certainly after all these years meeting physicians by any stretch of the imagination believe that every physician can do that. But I think that that's, that's what patients want is they want when when they're ready to be the person who kind of um, has an opinion and wants to be included and is ready to take charge, they want to be included. And they similarly want to, when they feel helpless and vulnerable and out of control, they want to be able to depend on, just like Dr. Engel Finger did. He wants to be able to wanted, wanted to be able to depend on somebody to say, "Listen, I've got all the information. I can help you. I can make those decisions for you." So I don't. I think I think there is no real answer except for that that we expect and we need flexibility. I think. Thank you. Uh, let's take a comment from the audience. Just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Marty McCary. I'm a cancer surgeon at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I really appreciated your comments, and what I've found oftentimes is that very few oncologists hit that right balance where um, they custom tailor the treatment to the patient. And you've seen this all the time. Some folks treat every single patient up until the day of their death with chemo and radiation, and others sort of write them off as there's nothing that can be done and they have a nihilistic approach. And when I've talked to the oncologists, they've, they've, it's almost as if there's two schools within oncology. And the school that's really um, promoting more appropriate care, care and care that's tailored to the patient feels that they're in the distinct minority within the oncology community. I found this huge split in the oncology community. How do we promote that minority group that's trying to address the issue of appropriateness and, and, that, and that's talking about these at the national meetings. As you know, the ASCO meeting, our big oncology meeting, the biggest paper presented showed a potential increase in survival for a treatment for brain cancer of about four weeks. If that's the biggest breakthrough in the field, then it seems like this conversation has been understated. Thank you for that question. I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, at the same ASCO meeting, there was a brilliant session that was held on how to communicate with patients better. That session, you had to have a map and a GPS to find. <laughs> it was in the bottom of the building, in a little room, because the expectation was that nobody would come. That meeting, that room was filled to capacity. It was overflowing. They had to get people out of that room. And someone said, this should be the plenary session. But you know, this is what people who build conferences and who are in charge, I hope, will we'll see. Um, because it is a problem. And I think the pro we perpetuate the problem. And, and, and a quick anecdote, but something that, that really sort of sent a shiver down my spine a few months ago. Um, I saw, I was sent a patient who traveled about three hours to see me. This is a patient who needed adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer who decided that she was against it and wanted to go for alternative treatments, etc. cetera. And uh, to, to cut a long story short, she said to me that she had come to me because a doctor and an oncologist had said to her that although he thought that she should have treatment, he knew of an oncologist who might think otherwise and who would happily support the patient to not have treatment. And it was almost like a condescending referral to say, I'm not going to tolerate this, but I know somebody who will. So I think if you have that sort of division within a medical profession, that's just shameful. Um, and, and we just have to support patients. We, we have to, patient-centered care is a big buzzword in Australia, and I'm sure it is here as well. But what I find time and again is it's about what doctors are doing to patients, not what we are asking patients um, about what needs to be done for them. 
Let me, um, I, so just in keeping us in time, I'm going to keep, you two are going to be uh, commenters. Diane, I just wanted to ask you to reflect for a second because these are situations that you encounter quite commonly. And uh, if you want to just give us, and then I'll go to S Stephen to say. Hi, Jesse. Um, I want to thank you for uh, sharing with us that challenge to the theme of this conference um, because I think it's very, very important. And I think the thoracic oncologist that you saw perhaps has been infected um, by the cost containment pressures, by the conversation about overtreatment, by the um, kind of acceptance of the notion that for all patients, uh, treatment is, particularly someone like you who's had four other cancers, is probably too much. And so it's a caution to all of us. It's a caution to all of us, um, and particularly as medical educators and people who mentor medical students and young physicians, to remember that there, there's lots of waste. And part of waste is not giving people treatment that might actually help them prolong their life and improve its quality. Um, and that it's a nuanced, decision, it's patient-centered, each individual is different in terms of what matters most to them. Um, but what that thoracic oncologist said to you is my worst nightmare about the results of a movement like this. And I think um, something that I hope we will remember your story throughout the course of the rest of this conference and in our future. And um, as a palliative care physician, we find ourselves as often trying to support patients and families who just want to get home and get out of the hospital and get good treatment as arguing with their doctors that they should have more care, more treatment. So we get calls from intensivists who want to talk patients and families out of continued intensive care. And we talk to the patient using a communicard. They point to letters. It takes a long time. Um, and explain the odds and the pros and cons um, so they understand what, what the future is likely to hold and elicit from them a preference, which in some cases is to continue, and then advocate for that with the critical care docs who look at us like, we called you in to help us get this person out of here. And here you are arguing that this person really wants to stay and should stay, and there's reasonable possibility, small but reasonable, that she will get off the ventilator and get out of the ICU. So it takes training. It takes a tremendous amount of skill and expertise to be able to engage intellectually with the, the data on the possibilities of these treatments and psychologically with who this person is and what matters most to them and to synthesize those and re resist the context and the context is both pressure to overtreat and now increasingly pressure to undertreat. And it's not easy. And there's no one right answer. And Jesse, I'm really grateful to you for reminding us about that at the very beginning of this conference. Let me, let me go. go ahead. Uh, I, I'm going to throw a contra into this. After all, as, as doctors, we're teachers. My name is Ron Weintraub. I'm the surgical safety officer at the Cambridge Health Alliance, which is an academic safety net hospital. I'm a retired cardiac surgeon. And I think patients often come to us and, and at, at the end, they're asking for our advice, which is sort of what would you do given what you know of me? And, and sometimes it's very easy. A patient with a tight main left who's very symptomatic, I really would try to persuade them to have coronary bypass operation. Patient with the right coronary arteries, a little bit symptomatic, I would say you don't need anything. But it's the middle ground which is the difficulty. And you can, you can set out the pros and the cons and you know this one's a mailman and he wants to continue working. This one's retired and he just has a wood shop. Uh, but in the, in, at, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, they're sort of asking, what should I do? What would you do? And I think unlike lawyers who say, well, on the one hand, there's this. On the other hand, there's this. What do you want to do? 
I think the doctor at the end of the game has to say, this is what I think you should do. If they, knowing everything, if they decide they want to go another path, you could say, that's reasonable and I'll support you in that choice. Thank you for that comment. I will say again, we build expectations into our patients. There are ways to have that conversation where people can feel supported and yet their preferences are, are elicited. I think when patients do come to me and say, what would you do? I say, I'll tell you what I would do, but you have to listen to me why I would do it, why, what my values are that would lead me to this decision. So at least give them a chance to say if they wouldn't fit their values, they, would, they could go another way. But I agree with you. It's a hard one. Please. Hello. I'm, I'm Marsha Hams. I'm from Community Catalyst, and we're a national consumer organization, and, and our mission really is to bring the voice of consumers into reforming the healthcare system, expanding access, working with advocates um, at the state level, at the, at the national level. And one of the things that I th think, and, and just sort of in reimagining how we could be organizing the system in a better way, it strikes me that the, that the challenge of this conversation between a patient and physician around very difficult treatment issues is such a lonely, a lonely matter for the patient. I mean, the physician presumably has support in their profession, discussion with their colleagues about the best approaches. The patient might have their family member, um, their community as a support system in some way, but it seems to me that we really need to figure out a way that we can have the patient have the kind of support system to talk these things over, to bring this into that conversation with the physician. Um, you know, I think of some of the ways in which this has been done successfully in the past with the AIDS movement, when you know there was a very empowered community, the working together to to talk to the medical profession, or the women's movement that actually talked a lot about reducing the level of of uh, care or, or uh, intensive care and birthing. And uh, where, uh, where, where, what do you think about you know, that need and where we might uh, help to make that happen? Um, that's a good question. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that, that I try to keep in mind and I say to my residents is that for the average oncologist treating, say, advanced lung cancer or advanced breast cancer, you'll see hundreds of people, hundreds of patients or more in your lifetime. But for the patient, it's their only journey. And I think it's critical to teach doctors and to continue to emphasize the value of empathy. I think we, we just can't do it enough. So from a medical training perspective, I, I think just simple even rep repeating things to residents such as this is the patient's only experience. So if they feel, if, if you feel that they're asking you really simple questions, it's because that's their experience. They don't know any better. They don't know any different. So I think from, from a medical education point of view, we just need to emphasize that, that a lot and a lot more. And I'm, I'm heartened to see that there are more communication skills programs uh, slowly coming up. I, I think the value of patient support groups can't be underestimated too. And good patient support groups, I think, and, and good organizations really do empower patients. Um, I see that that's particularly true of the female cancers, but I think a lot of men suffer from the lack of good support organizations. I mean, you know, breast cancer and pink is, is everywhere. Uh, ovarian cancer support is growing, but I think we need to broaden that sort of support structure to, to other cancers and to include other people. Right, so good on you for doing your work. Great, so let me, we're gonna need to move on to the next part. Katie, you had something quick you wanted to say. I just wanted to say quickly, I, I don't know, if, is my mic on? Yes. Um, I think there really is a possibility for a national caregivers and former caregivers movement, and a lot of us are women who actually did come through the, uh, the women's movement and the women's health movement. And so I really, um, I, I do think that there needs to be a grassroots movement that's self-identified in some way. I'm not sure exactly how, if it's caregiving. Are, yeah. I think it's a great idea. There are organizations, actually. Yeah. I know Gail Hunt and others, but, so, yeah. but that, I, it's a very and important group. I want group. to read a quote from Ivan Illich, who wrote uh, Medical Nemesis. By working creatively and in ways not yet thought of, the lobby of the dying and the gravely ill could become a healing force in society. Thank yeah. you. I'm going to just, uh, we're going to go on with 
Becky uh, in the next part, but we also have room for comments at the end uh, as well, and we'll do it at each of the end of the section. So I don't know, Becky, you want to? Uh... Hi. <laughs> um, so um, as you have in the program, I'll be sharing today um, my birth story, just so you have a little background about me. I'm, I am a registered nurse, and I do work in maternity care. Um, and for a long time, it was very hard for me to share this story because one, I felt embarrassed. I knew better. How could this happen to me? Um, and I also kind of felt like a fool because so many people could not recognize how much impact what happened to me had on me and continues to have on me. And, and until I was able to meet and speak with other women who had gone through similar experiences and felt the same way, I kind of felt like, no, I'm not a fool. I'm, I'm a victim of this system. And, and no, one, no one is removed from it because of your education and your stance and who you know and what you know because, and like in many other areas, when you become the patient, you are so vulnerable. Everything you think you know goes out the window because now you're a ball of emotions because this is your life, this is your experience. And you doubt everything and you become so reliant on that provider you chose and that support system you chose. And it's really important that um, hopefully as you're giving care to your patients to, to remember that they trust you, but you also have to reflect that they have desires. I, I have a plan. I, I know what I want. I, I was very um, intent on picking a specific provider because I work in the field and I see a lot. Um, very much so that I didn't even go to where I work because I think in my mind ignorance was bliss. Um, there are certain things I didn't want to know about my provider. Um, but I, I went with someone who was highly recommended who had the same philosophies that I did. Our first conversation was wonderful. I immediately was like, this is it, this is right, this is a perfect balance for me and for my spouse who believes, you know, the doctor knows everything, we should go with that. And I'm like, I, I, I would really prefer a less is more approach. Um, someone who is going to respect my body and respect this process. And this is not a unique story. This story is something that has been told and will be told and belongs and will belong to so many women. Um, so I'll start with that I was a very low risk pregnancy. I was easy. Sometimes they would send in a, you know, a new provider or someone, oh, she's easy. You can just go through it. You know, no biggie. So, you know, I believe that there is a time and place for interventions and for other things, but I was not that patient. So we make it to 40 weeks, yay, the big mark, the egg timer went off and of course I didn't go into labor. Um, so we just go in for our normal 40 week appointment. Um, they did an NST, uh, an on stress stress, just to make sure the baby looked okay, did an ultrasound, checked fluid, wanted to see everything. Everything looked great. I mean, I of course can read that this is a reactive strip, baby looks good, I'm not so great at the ultrasound, but you know, the ultrasound tech was pretty positive and had a smiling face, so that usually means good things. So we go into the waiting room and you know we're just waiting to hear from our provider which I would assume be like baby looks great all right go walk up a hill you know um, eat spicy food whatever it is all the little wife tales about getting you to go into labor um, and up until this point my provider was very adamant I don't believe in induction if you go into labor naturally it is so much better for you it'll be so much better an experience which I of course have seen and believe and agree with which is why I went with her um, and so, you know, we're just sitting in the room and we wait and she comes in and she starts, baby looks great, everything looks great. I'm like, okay, but, but, but what? <laughs> and she said, well, you know, the ultrasound, you know, we did a measurement on the baby and, and the baby, we think this is gonna be a really big baby. We think this baby, this baby is measuring about nine, nine, uh, nine pounds, eight pounds, 15 ounces. And so of course, you know, my first thought is, great, that's a lot to push out. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so, okay. And she goes, well, I think, I think we should, we should induce. And with those words, you know, I went from being confident. I was, I knew what I wanted. We were on the same, same playing field, we, same team to what, what, excuse me. And, and all of a sudden, this wave of doubt, this, this, this climate of confidence turned to just a climate of total and utter doubt. Because why would you suggest, why would she suggest something that we just 
you know, last week said, no, that's not an option. It's unless, you know, unless there's some reason, this is not an option. And, and, you know, she sits there and she says, you know, I really, this baby's really big. I think you're already at risk for a C-section. So, you know, this, the sooner we do this, you know, less, gives the baby less chance to grow bigger. And this was such a complete and utter shock to me that I don't even think I really could respond. I think I just stood there while she spoke and I was kind of in a, in a dream state because I, I really just didn't know what was ha what is happening here. This is not, this is not the plan. It's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so she goes, okay, well, you know, I'll let you and your husband discuss. I'll step out and I'll come back and you can let me know what you want to do. So in, magically in the five minutes it's going to take for her to go around on another patient in the office and then come back, I'm supposed to magically have made this wonderful and informed decision about what I want because now I feel so confident in anything I believe or understand. Um, and, and, it, it, and it wasn't a shared decision. You know, she's not like she sat there and said, I know that this is what you believe and this is what you wanted and, and let's discuss why induction may be good or bad for a big baby. What's the evidence? None of that happened. It was, there you go, let me know yes or no. And of course, my, bless his heart, my husband, you know, is trying to be supportive in the best way he knows how, which is, you picked her, you liked her, you trust her. <laughs> if, if you think, if, if, if you, th you know, if she really thinks that you should do this, then we should do this. And, and of course, me and my hormonal self, um, and very unsure of myself and very, uh, felt, uh, feeling so incredibly torn, you know, she came in and I, I you know, I said, you know, okay, well, well what kind of induction? Because I certainly was not going to go in there and be pitted because that was going to suck. Um, so, you know, we just, she said, well, you know, we're going to try minimalist. We're just going to try a Foley bulb induction where they put a Foley bulb and they inflate it with fluid and put it between your cervix and the placenta to put pressure on the cervix to dilate. Because she said, I just think you need a kickstart. That'll get you going. And then once that goes, You'll just be gone. You'll you'll have your, your natural labor, no IV, nothing. We'll do intermittent monitoring. So in a way, you know, kind of selling me on if we just do this one thing, we just force this one thing, you'll get everything else you want. Here here's what you want. This is how we can get there, and this is the only choice. Because really not doing it wasn't a choice because it wasn't a discussion to not do it. So she goes and she makes the phone call and says, okay, be here at this time. And, um, you know, go home, get, you know, my bag settled, get everything ready and really try to be positive and focus on positive stories and speak to people on positive experiences because I didn't want to hear any of the negative because that wasn't going to be me. Um, so we get there and, and we start and, and, you know, and, Things go as planned. Great, awesome. You know, it's exactly what she said. She comes in, kickstarts labor. I'm, I'm going, uh, wandering around the halls, um, getting in the shower, whatever it is that I needed to do. And then the bulb comes out. I'm four to five. Twelve hours into this, my labor halts. Okay. You know, and I could have literally been sitting here having this conversation with you. That's how. You know, from like, you know, rub my back, let me roll in the shower, I can't talk to you right now, to really, truly being able to have a conversation. And she comes in, and, and she says, okay, well, your labor calls it, okay, that happens. Um, so here are your options. First one, eh, you don't want that. We, that all, you know, it's just there, I'm going to put it out there, eh, go home, but you don't want to do that. So immediately dismissed the suggestion, which, of course, why would I want to follow that? If you think it's a stupid idea, then obviously I'm going to think it's a stupid idea. I've been laboring for 12 hours. I'm not really thinking straight, nor can I really honestly think for myself. Last thing I want is, like, give me the ice chips and move away, you know, and then, you know, back off, okay, buddy? Like, you did enough here. So, you know, and then the other options, which one was ridiculous because, I mean, it just wasn't a really valid option. The third option was Pitocin, which is, of course, something I wanted to avoid. But when you don't believe in A, B is stupid, and C is the only option, well, you might as well have been holding up a big sign with an arrow. This is what we're going to do, whether or not you realize that I'm making the decision for you. So that's what we did. And of course, 
I didn't respond to it at all. At all. I did not. I mean, I'm on max 20 units of pit, sitting, sitting there watching the Carolina Duke game with the surgeon. Um, um, so, you know, and at that point in the night, I'd already begun to feel so incredibly disempowered. It was no longer about what it was for me. It was about now you're just part of an algorithm. A doesn't go well, we go to B, we go to C. It's not about what's, what's important or what's going on. So we go through the night, they let me rest, which any of you know there is no such thing of rest in a hospital. Um, and day two continue, day two starts and it's more interventions, more Pitocin, more monitoring, more, you know, just nonstop. And it was like, I can't make it any, compare it any more to just feeling like a science experiment. All of a sudden, oh, uh, you know, we're going to, and, you know, I knew what all of the things were, but having them done to me was It made me feel so broken. Everything wasn't about the treat. It's not the treatment's not working. Your body's not ready. It's you're not responding. Your cervix is not dilating. Everything aimed to make me feel like I'm not doing the right thing. So you need to keep trying to make to fix it because I'm broken. I need you to fix me. I need you to get this baby out. We need to get the baby out. You need to do something because in no way was any part of that experience empowering me to do this. That somehow, magically, up until this point, I was supposed to trust my body to grow this baby. This is what we tell people all the time. Trust your body. It'll tell you your limits. It'll tell you what you, to do. It's such a powerful, so just listen to yourself. But magically, when it comes to birth, no. Absolutely override any feeling or emotion you have. And I remember just breaking down because I didn't even want to be present anymore. I didn't want to be part of it anymore because it wasn't what I wanted. And if I escaped by just going to my happy place or whatever it was, it wasn't happening anymore. So much so that I didn't even, we were supposed to have someone come in photo and to photograph the birth. And, you know, so we had those moments so that my husband and I could share them together because he can't work a camera by any means. And... <laughs> She called, and I told my husband to decline it. I didn't want to remember any of it. <laughs> to feel so bad, to, to have some sort of evidence. This terrible thing was happening to me. How is this happening to me? I didn't want any of that. And the rest of the day was just, just that, an algorithm. This goes to this, to this, to this, to this. And then, you know, you end up, you know, in the OR on the hard stainless steel table, sorry, and I had one just in case. Um, and you immediately feel as if you, I didn't already feel this way to begin with, like the ultimate failure. I failed myself. And everything was about that I had done it. I was broken. I was Somehow, my body was a lemon. It didn't know what to do. And, and for me, and this is probably more unique to my story, I was so tired at that point because up until that point, I had avoided the epidural. I said, if there's only one thing that I can do is I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to struggle through getting through these Pitocin contractions and having every God knows wire stuck up inside me. But I'm going to do this and I'm going to, stupidly do this my way, which means that I'm going to do without enough girl. I'm going to get up and walk around because that was the only thing I could do. That was the only power I did have. And so by the time we got to the OR and they, they did the spinal, I was out. I was so physically tired and emotionally tired at that point that um, I think I probably did have a little bit of an anxiety attack when they laid me back because, of course, this was not what I wanted. And and, and I, fell, I passed out, whether or not the, anesthesi the anesthesiologist gave me anything, I don't know, because at that point, and really the entire second day, there was no discussion. 
There was no discussion when she broke my water. There was no discussion about the internal monitors. There was no discussion about the amnion fusion. There was no discussion. They just assumed, oh, well, you do this. You know what, what it is. I don't have to discuss it with you. If you don't want it, you would have spoken up. Has anyone tried to have a conversation with a woman in labor? Really? No. So, you know, and for me, forget all of it. You know, if the baby was was going bad if she had a bad strip, if she was having decelerations, if there was something that showed that she was in distress, cut me open without anesthesia. There was nothing you can stop a mother from trying to protect her child. But that, that wasn't happening. She was fine. Her, her strip was textbook. I mean, so beautiful, so easy to read, so easy to see there. I mean, it was just, but it was, it was you know, I lay there and, you know, I felt, you know, they, kept, they kept trying to wake me up so that I could be part of the process as if stand, sitting behind some big curtain with a big light in your face and tubes and an anesthesiologist right here is somehow being part of a process. Um, I did, and, I, and I passed out and I don't, I don't have any recollection of my daughter crying for the first time, which if any of you in the room are a parent, you will know how pivotal that first cry is, how important that's, I'm here, I'm alive. This, here, here I am. I don't, I don't have that, I don't remember that. I don't, I wasn't part of it. I didn't get to, to hold her, to see her, to count her fingers or her toes or any of those things that are so important in the process of becoming a mother. And, and, it, and it was gone. And the entire, the entire thing was, it was so frustrating because as I was feeling this way, not a single person acknowledged how I was feeling. And it wasn't as if they couldn't see it playing on my face. I mean, I... I think I cried on multiple occasions as things weren't going as planned or I wasn't responding. But not a single person acknowledged how I felt or how, cared. I mean, did they care? Did my provider really care that she went against any of the discussions we had, that she, she didn't follow anything I wanted? And, and, you know, if she had just come in the room and said, you know what, your body's tired. It's obviously not ready. Go home and sleep. I would have listened to her without question. I would have not argued that, but because she didn't give me those choices. It was no longer about Becky. It was about patient and LDR3. And, and that to me was, was really harmful. And, 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 and it has changed me in a way that I don't think I could ever, ever have imagined. It's changed my patient care in a way that I've ever imagined because I make it a point that when I get a patient who basically is my story, when they come to me and, and I get them or I'm receiving and I, and I look at them and I said, I say to them, and I say this to everyone, it's okay for you to be upset about what just happened to you. And it's okay if you wanna cry about it because I'll be here to hold your hand because I know how you feel. And so many women don't feel like they have even the power to feel that way. And no one really does acknowledge. I mean, the only person who acknowledged me, that I didn't get what I wanted or that I had gone through something terrible was the surgeon that I had met for five minutes who had just changed shifts. She was the new person on call for Sunday night. She came up to me at the end of the section. She woke me up and she held my hand and she said, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. I'm so sorry. And I have done, I know that when you have another child, you're going to want a VBAC. You're going to want a vaginal birth. I, I know that. And I have done everything in my power so that that would be possible. I put dual sutures and you know that whole, and that was the only person in that moment, was the only moment that I felt like someone actually sees me. But for the rest of it, I had to fight for everything I wanted. I had to fight for my daughter to come into the PACU, that if somehow it's ungodly that I actually, she actually, she just came out of me. What does it matter where she is or who she's with? She needs to be with me. And, and, and so, that's it in a, a, a somewhat brief, <laughs> a somewhat brief nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Ma Maureen, if you want to. Yeah, wow. Um, well, Becky, thank you for sharing your story. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of confidence to do it, and I um, appreciate it. Um, just a couple thoughts. I mean, how many women who've given birth and, and fathers who've been present at the birth of their children, um, 
could think back vividly on your own experiences. It, I, I think even 67-year-old women remember their births. Um, so it, it's really a critical time in the life of a woman. And we must have more sensitivity about the experience and, and the role of the patient and making sure that, if possible, as long as everything's medically OK, that the woman and her family try to get the birth experience that they want. Um, just a little bit about the context for which I will share my remarks. I'm executive director of a national organization called, Matern uh, called Childbirth Connection. And we're 95 years old this year, and we're the best kept secret in, in the maternity space, I keep saying. Um, but anyway, um, our mission now is to improve the quality and value of maternity care through consumer engagement and health systems transformation. And <clears throat> we've been promoting evidence-based maternity care for years through a website that um, has a side for women and a side for health professionals. And we accumulate the best evidence. And th for those of you who are not in maternity care, one of the things we have is a wealth of systematic reviews that can guide safe and effective maternity care practice, education, policy, et cetera. The problem is we're not using it. And it's not part of routine maternity care in our country. And what we see is overuse of interventions like elective delivery and cesarean section, episiotomies, other things like that. Um, we also see underuse, which I think is really important in the context of our conference here. We tend to talk more about overuse, but underuse in maternity care is really a concern because there are so many practices that we know are safe and effective for mothers and babies that aren't being utilized. And part of Becky's story when she said she had to fight to get her daughter back to see her. Um, even there are many leading hospitals across the country that understand uh, the value of skin to skin and mother baby attachment and are providing that baby to moms even who've had cesareans, assuming the mom and baby are still fine. And yet, 68% of moms don't even get in touch with their child. They're taken away for routine care in the nursery or to scrub their head. I'll never forget the image of our first granddaughter. My uh, daughter-in-law gave birth and everything was fine and they said um, she was with her mom and dad for about 15 minutes, which was great. And then they said to the grandparents, you can go see the baby, she's in the nursery. And we went in, she wasn't in the nursery, she was having her head scrubbed with a brush under the water uh, in, by a nurse, and, and she was screeching, and it was just such a horrible image. Whereas there are leading institutions that are keeping moms and babies together for hours and hours. It's really great. So that's just one area about underuse um, that I think is really important. And then we see practice variation is a problem, just like in other areas of medicine. But um, Childbirth Connection uses the best evidence to frame our agenda, but we also have conducted a series over the last decade of national surveys called Listening to Mothers. And um, Harris Interactive has conducted them for us. They're nationally representative surveys. So when we speak about women's experiences with care, we speak not from our anecdotal information, but from validated surveys. And we've got a decade of those surveys available now. And what we're finding is experiences a lot like Becky's, where women um, are empowered through information that they often find on the internet. And whether it's trustworthy or not, we're not sure. But they get information. And then they go and choose a, a, a provider that they think will give them the birth experience that they want. But it doesn't happen that way very often. And you probably know our C-section rate in our country is at 32.8%. And our VBAC rate is less than 10%. So the problem is that once you have a primary C-section, it's unlikely that you'll have an opportunity for a vaginal birth after cesarean. And one thing that I love about Becky's story is that um, she refers to the climate of doubt that she experienced. But she's turned that climate of doubt into what I call the climate of confidence. And that is she empowered herself to go to make a decision to find a provider and to have a home birth, right? Well, we're doing birth, in North Carolina, birth, center. birth, it's 
it's a, it's a little bit of a problem, but a birth center. Birth center birth, out of hospital birth center yes. birth with a midwife. And she's fully aware of the benefits and harms associated with that decision. But nevertheless, she's made that decision and she feels conf uh, confident about it. I think that's Without really, really, really important. Which brings me to um, some positive things that are happening in our space. And um, one of them, the most promising for me, and I think Childbirth Connection, is our relationship with the Informed Medical Decisions Foundation here in Boston. And two years ago, we started a national initiative, a partnership called the First National Maternity Care Shared Decision-Making Initiative, which now has a name called Pregnant Me. And we're in the process of developing the first three uh, decision aids called Smart Decision Guides on three topics that are driving a lot of the overuse currently. And one is uh, elective delivery for suspected large baby, which is uh, Becky's situation, of course not supported by the evidence. The second is elective delivery uh, before 40, 41 weeks. And that again isn't supported if the mother and baby are doing well. And lastly, planned cesarean versus uh, vaginal birth after cesarean, which we know is supported by ACOG and NIH guidelines yet rarely happening. So we really believe that the shared decision-making process that occurs between the woman and her provider is really a critical one. And just as everybody's talked about today, for obvious reasons, if the woman and the provider can make that decision together and go through the birth experience, um, I think it's much more beneficial for both parties because caregivers want to do the right thing too and they want to be happy and feel good about their uh, experience. And um, I think lastly, I, just the takeaway is the importance of empowering women with information, treating them with dignity and respect for a process that's very intimate and so important for the rest of their lives and to society. And thank you, Becky, for sharing your story today, and we wish you all the best as you go forth in your pregnancy and birth. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think, what time uh, do we have? To, yeah, what, I, what I'd like to do is just allow for, so we have four people, give four brief comments and maybe responses, and then we'll go to Katie. There's also time at the end, so I know more people have just come in line. I'm just going to take four, and then we'll, uh, We'll, we'll do it. So we'll start here, go back and forth, and just try to get some quick dialogue about this. But I want to make sure that we get in the final part of this, and then we'll have questions at the end. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Smith. Uh, I'm a family physician. And Becky, thank you for your story. It was very moving and disturbing, because it brings me back 40 years ago uh, when I had the first delivery of a woman who I followed you know, through the entire prenatal uh, process into delivery, and, and it was a story almost identical to yours. I mean, she came into, into the labor floor, you know, perfect non-stress tests, and I was trained as a family physician in a non-interventional way and wanted to just let the labor progress. Uh, but the, the OB residents and OB attendings that I was working with at the hospital I was at said, well, no, 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 come on, let's, let's, let, let, you know, let's break her water and, and move things along. And it took everything I could to prevent that from happening, but it was such an incredible fight. Uh, and, you know, the question is, that was 40 years ago. And to think that that's still happening today is so disheartening. And I, I, I want to know why. And, and perhaps, and I, I throw this out, is that my training was to focus on, on the patient. And when I tried to do that, I was characterized as being unscientific and, and you know, anti-whatever. Uh, and it's still happening today. And we need to change the educational environment to support focusing on the patient, like Dr. Lown says, do everything you can for the patient and as little as we can to the patient. I'm leading, along with Lena Wen, the workshop on, on education, medical education on Thursday. And I would welcome as many people as you as who, who want to, to attend our, our, our workshop to figure out how do we change that educational in, uh, process and that educational environment to be for the patient. Thank you, Becky, for sharing your story. Thank you. 
I'm Howard Brody. I'm a family physician, also in medical humanities. Uh, Becky and Maureen said wonderful things, but they only had so much time. I feel like I need to add something. There's a myth that has been promulgated that people like Becky, please forgive me for even saying such a thing, are motivated by some kind of ideological feminist lifestyle and they don't really care about their babies and that only the overuse providers uh, are the ones who really are the advocates for the fetus or for the newborn. And this has been looked at by folks like the Childbirth Connection. It is totally a myth. It is totally false. People like Becky who want what Becky wants, they are very dedicated, concerned mothers who are putting the interests of their children first on the list. They are really, really, really trying hard to be the best mothers they know how to be and really care about their children. And we must avoid any hint that what justifies this overuse is somehow that someone else is the advocate for the baby or for the fetus. Thank you, Howard. Jerome Huffman, I'm from UCLA. Um, we've heard a couple of very moving stories about, uh, about interactions that uh, had unhappy endings in some sense, or that may be having unhappy endings. But I think it's really important for us to distinguish between content and, and um, form. That is, there are two things that we could latch onto out of the problem. One is, what was the advice that was given? What were the actions that were taken? And the other is, how was it presented to patients and what was the quality of the communication? And I think what we're really hearing mostly today is about failed communication, mm. which is why appropriately a lot of the comments of the, of the panel has been about shared decision making and how do we talk to patients. Even with that, we don't have enough time to really talk about that in great detail because that's a very complicated subject. Where is it appropriate to say, what would you do, do doctor? And, and even that's a very, a very much more less much more nuanced question than we're giving it credit for it's what would you do if you were me doctor not what, what you would, would you do if you were you yeah. those are very very different things in addition there's a there is a place as we heard before for I want a doctor who's gonna help me by taking on some responsibility versus I want a doctor who's gonna help me engage in a shared process where we both participate and those the boundaries for that are very, very, very complicated. But I think understanding the critical nature of communication and shared decision making mm -hmm. with patients mm -hmm. shouldn't be confused with rejecting over-treatment because the patient didn't get to pick what they want. So Diane said something before about how the Jesse's, um, what, what Jesse experienced is her nightmare of what might happen with this movement. And I have to say, I have a lot of trouble with that. I, don't, I think the nightmare of what happened had nothing to do with this movement or with overtreatment. It had to do with a failure of communication between doctor and patient. Now, I'm not an expert in oncology, and I don't know whether or not there is anything to be offered by chemotherapy in Jesse's case. I have no idea. I would love to have been a fly on the wall and who have heard that conversation had Jesse gone to see Ranjana and hear how that would have gone. I don't suspect it would have gone, oh sure, you want, over, you want chemotherapy, you can have it. But I don't know, maybe there is a place for that. But certainly there are places where there should be a limit on what we offer patients. And the problem is not setting that limit, the problem is failing to communicate. And ultimately, it goes back to what Don Berwick said, which is expect patient expectations. If we want to deal with this, the, this enormous problem that we have in American healthcare, I think we have to address the expectations that we have created for patients and not worry that we're, the overtreatment movement is going to deny them the things that they need. That is a possibility, but I don't think that's a big possibility. And I don't think it's the issue we should be worried about. We should be worried about two things. One is communication with patients, and the other is how do we fix these bizarre expectations we have created for ourselves and for our community? Um, thank you, Jerome. I, 
I do wonder in the case of Jesse's whether there was an issue about what that doctor thought the prospects were and whether the information was informed by good facts too. So there's communication and there's what's flowing into the content of that communication. Last comment and then we'll go to Katie. Hi, my name's Kathy Day and I'm a nurse. Uh, I trained at um, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Brighton in 1967 to 1970. Um, and thank you, Becky, for sharing your story, but I just thought I'd share with you that back then, uh, the silent patient was the best patient in maternity, and so, um, <laughs> so mothers were doped up true. with Demerol and scopolamine. Um, unfortunately, they weren't always silent. They said things they would never say if they were <laughs> coherent and with it. <laughs> and it was particularly entertaining because we had nuns on the floor. <laughs> so a few years after that, I, I was pregnant for my own children, and I, went, I had the opportunity to come back and visit St. Elizabeth's, and a friend of mine was working on maternity, and they were still using Demerol and scopolamine regularly, and I was in Lamaze classes, so we were progressing in, in Maine where they weren't progressing here in, uh, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. I, I'm sure things have changed by now. It's a long time ago. Um, but I was induced for both of, my preg both of my children. Didn't think I had any choice. So I think it's really, really important that women, when they do become pregnant, have a plan. And maybe it's time that we need to communicate our plans to our doctors rather than having our doctors communicate their plan for us. Um, in the form of a letter. We could do it in a letter. We could do it in our first interview. We could do it however we have to do it. But we need to give power to women that are having babies and uh, avoid some of these unnecessary treatments. Thanks again, Becky. It was wonderful. Do you mind if I respond? I just want to respond to your, to your point. And um, I'm very fortunate to have um, kind of merged myself into this community of birth awareness uh, now that I kind of feel empowered to. And what I find, not only where I work, but just hearing other women's stories of doing just that, having a birth plan, being well-informed, well-educated. I mean, I can't, some of these women could probably recite for you the ACOG guidelines. Really, truly and honestly. And they know what the evidence says. And they know what's the best care for them. And the minute they get into the hospital, and I'm not lying, and this is not unique to where I work or where I've been. Oh, she has a birth plan? What time's the section? Not even kidding you. So many people's response to that is, oh, well, she thinks she knows what she wants. But we'll just see how that goes. So I think it's important that on the other end that we not only learn, learn to, sh to communicate both on both <coughs> ends, empowering the patient to communicate with us, but also uh, feeling empowered to make sure that we are communicating with the patients, but that we've also learned to respect that and understand that and know that, yeah, I may think this is best, but this is what she wants, and I'm going to try my damnest to give it to her. So. Can I make a quick comment? Please, Diane. So this reminds me of what Harlan said earlier about uh, consult service rounds, that basically the entire hospital is organized around the convenience of the staff and the hospital, and the patient is almost an irritant if they weren't if they weren't the means of if they weren't the means of financial support, they're certainly not center. They're certainly not center, and so this notion that um, it's not like again, I really don't think it's like any of these clinicians meant to do harm or mean to do harm. Um, they're, they're caught up in a machinery that drives what we do just as you are attending on the consult service, you know, you round with your team. And the fact that people wait all day for you is not something you can control. Um, so again, let's just be careful about attribution of um, malice and uh, poor, people are practicing as they were trained people are practicing in the systems that are designed to deliver this really inappropriate care. Um, and it's really a system design and a medical and nursing education. Huge change that's needed. Yeah, I, I, I think it's that somehow we're, we're not trained to see through the patient's eyes. 
and we, we have our own filters on it. It's a power issue, too. I mean, but the systems have to be designed to share the power. And I think we've all had this experience. So when we're patients or when loved ones are patients, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get your preferences out there. And um, for many people, it's a too tiring a struggle. It's a too hard to do because you're in need of health care. I mean, you're in a vulnerable position. And, and we've got to reconfigure. This is part of the revolution, because, which I think we can strap to the back of this right care, which is that uh, where is the healing? Where is the, where's the patient perspective in this? And where are we valuing that? I think there is the tension for me is between when you are a cheerleader helping to coax someone through fear to get to a place where they actually want to go and yielding to the understanding that their preferences do, you know, should dominate the ultimate decision among options. And again, it's the skill of understanding the difference between holding someone's hand, crossing you know, a very difficult uh, stream, and recognizing that someone doesn't want to go across that stream. And you know how to get that is really hard. Katie, you've got a lot of wisdom in uh, your experience. I wonder yeah. if you'd share some with us. Sure. I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to stand because I'm going to do my equivalent of a PowerPoint, which is a couple of photographs. Um, I was just very, is my mic on? Or yes. It, yeah. I was just uh, very impressed with what Becky just said at the end about having a birth plan and then having the birth plan completely overridden. Because I often say to people, you know, just saying to, saying to your friends, take me out and shoot me is not an end of life plan. <laughs> and <laughs> if you don't have an end of life plan, someone else has an end of life plan for you. And it may not be the end of life plan you want. And so of course I encourage people to have all these plans. And yet I know from all of the people I've talked to how often the end of life plan is also disregarded or in some cases literally yeah. ripped out of the chart. So it, it's only a beginning for us to be able to have a plan. And I think the whole question of empowerment and conversation is so important. I'm here because I don't want other people's parents to suffer unnecessarily on their way to death the way my parents suffered. I think there's a lot of natural suffering on the way to death. We're saying goodbye to everybody we love. We have feelings of remorse or needing forgiveness. And those end of life tasks are so important and so meaningful and often painful. But we've now added a level of suffering to the end of life that I find absolutely outrageous. A fifth of people die in intensive care now. And I did not make up this phrase, but intensive care is medically sanctioned torture. And people who survive intensive care and come out literally often have a hallucination that they were literally being tortured in intensive care. So for a health system like ours, to have a fifth of the people dying that way is to me at just an incredible emblem of medical failure. And so is people being shocked on the deathbed by an internal ICD, an internal defibrillator, that nobody has taken the responsibility to make sure gets turned off. And to describe the deathbed shock of a defibrillator as uncomfortable I think the use of euphemism in medicine is really something that has to go. Three quarters of people say they want to die at home, but only a quarter of people do end up dying at home. And the problem is that people think that all they have to do is say to their friends, just take me out in the field and shoot me, or I don't want to die plugged into machines, that that's enough to ensure that they don't end up with the kind of death that they don't want. And I, I think it's a very long trajectory, and we've been saying these things over and over today, conversation and true relationship that starts long before the actual dying process is absolutely crucial. 
How do you expect a family to end up in an ER because they didn't know not to call 911 and then end up with a relative in an ICU and a doctor they have never met before comes out and drags them into a broom closet or a conference room with leftover lunch leavings and then says, please trust me, we really think we should remove your relative, we shouldn't trach, we should, you know, this is the decision making point. That's so unfair to those critical care doctors. And a lot of them, and nurses, and a lot of them suffer anguish from the experiences they feel they're being forced to do because a family is insisting. And I'm sure some of you have some variation of the nephew from Peoria phrase in your hospital, which is that somebody flies in at the last minute who has not been part of the family decision making and insists that everything be done. And because partly of the fear of litigation, which I do think is um, real, they know that that nephew from Peoria is going to be the one who sues. It's not going to be the person who was appointed the medical proxy. So I'm going to show you my parents' pictures, talk to you a little bit about their experience, and um, hopefully emphasize some points that we haven't already addressed today. This is my mother and father. They're Jeffrey and Valerie Butler. This is them. Um, they were South Africans. This is them shortly after they met. They are on a playing field in South Africa, a college playing field. My mother's just run a foot race barefoot, and it started to rain. And my father has folded her into his army overcoat. And you can't see from the picture, but he actually has only one arm. He lost his arm in the Second World War. He would have died had it not been for all of the modern medicine, the medical miracles that I now question when they are misused. So they left, yeah, you can see too. Um, they, they left South Africa. They went to England where my father went to Oxford and then they moved to the US. He became a professor at Wesleyan University. And then, uh, this is my parents two years after my father had a major stroke. He's 81, my mother's 79. And I'm in the middle and I'm still dyeing my hair. Um, <laughs> so, if you look at his face, I think you can see this state of bewilderment that he was thrust in after the stroke and never ever recovered from. And if you look at my mother's face, I think you can see the exhaustion of the full-time caregiver. We have 29 million Americans helping take care of someone over 75 now. And a lot of them are women like my mother, who at the end of my father's life was literally caregiving something like 100 or 120 hours a week. So even those of you who've been through medical school, um, the burden that is falling on caregivers now is absolutely immense. It's silent, they're unidentified, they're insufficiently rewarded, they're insufficiently supported, um, they're politically almost powerless, and there is a well of exhaustion and also outrage. A year after my father's stroke, a year, um, he was given a pacemaker. It was one of these, I think a lot of us have talked about some version of what looks like a no-brainer or a very small decision, actually is sort of the part, the beginning of a snowball. Mm. And in my father's case, he had, um, he had a hernia, he needed hernia surgery, he needed a cardiac clearance. For five years, he'd had asymptomatic bradycardia, a slow heartbeat, occasional drop beats, but he had zero physical symptoms connected with his slow heartbeat. He was also quite athletic. They walked a couple miles a day. So to get the cardiac clearance, the cardiologist simply said, well, I can't do it. He needs a pacemaker before we do the hernia surgery. And, he, and as we've discussed, this was not any discussion of pros, cons, and alternatives. They wasn't looking at what this decision really meant. And only later did my mother and I, and my father even, except he couldn't articulate it at that point, really question the long-term implications of this, which are moral, emotional, as well as medical. 
because what happened was my father was deprived of one avenue for a natural death. And at about the time that that photo was taken, he was saying to my mother things like, I'm depressed and I'm living too long. And this was a very stoic man who had survived a great deal physically in his life. So the surgery went beautifully. The informed consent talked only about the risks of minor surgery. It certainly didn't talk about the risks of living too long. Mm -hmm. The family doctor who my parents absolutely adored, Dr. Fales, was absolutely against this pacemaker going in. But again, because we have this very fragmented medical system, he was notified by fax that it was going to take place, and he's a family doctor. And those of you who are know how busy you are and how little you are paid for your time. The pacemaker cost Medicare about $10,000. Dr. Fales would have been paid $54 if he had sort of said, stop the presses. I got to talk to all these people by phone. Can we just do a temporary pacemaker for while the surgery is going on? Can we do the surgery a different way so we're only using local anesthetic? You know, can we uh, you know, hook him up to an external and then take it off afterwards? Can the family sign something saying they understand the risks? None of, he would have been paid $54. And that would be only if my father went into the office, okay? And then an extra something like 20 or so if he'd send in more paperwork to justify a longer discussion. This is just crazy. And that the $10,000 pacemaker was paid for in a heartbeat, literally. Um, but my father really benefited from speech therapy after he had his stroke. He had a fabulous speech therapist who was helping him write his autobiography, because partly because he'd been a professor, he actually could do better on the computer than he could do speaking. And so he was writing his life story, including a description of how he'd lost his arm at the age of 21, which I still have and treasure. But it was cut off because that year, Congress was concerned about the Medicare budget. And so they decided to limit occupational and speech therapy to $1,500 a year. And at that point in the Medicare system, you had to also show that you were actually improving to maintain something like a speech therapy. Whereas for my father, simply not getting worse would have been a major, major benefit so I just feel the whole system, the reimbursement system being upside down like this is absolutely huge. The fact that palliative care is mostly paid for still by foundations or you know, getting money from somewhere else in a hospital budget and that Diane Meyer would be paid like a third of what a cardiac, you know, an interventional cardiologist would be paid for his time is just absolutely insane. That's generous. Okay, <laughs> that's generous, yeah, okay. I talked, to one car yeah, I talked to one palliative care doctor who said that, you know, we were just sort of working out the figures because he has partly a university appointment and, you know, so he's sort of subsidized by that. And we, were, we, we figured out that if he'd been paid uh, strictly as a palliative care doctor, he would make about $40,000 a year, you know. So I, I couldn't, you know, I wrote a whole book about this and I really couldn't rest until I understood why this had happened. And I really ended up looking at really big qu picture questions, which I really think need to be in the mix here. There are three major powerful lobbies in Washington. They are finance, defense, and healthcare. St. Jude Medical, which made my father's pacemaker, usually has profits of around 20% a year. And these are year in, year out profits, and they're about double everything else in the S&P 500. So we have we have a system because uh, I think Don was talking about it originally, where there's no pricing control. The pacemaker costs very little less than it cost it when it was first invented in the 60s. Um, there's no supply and demand, there's no competition. So there's, we've given them these guaranteed high prices, but really not asked for anything in return. The result is they have a lot of money, they finance most of the cardiology research, uh, you know, that's relevant to their work. And they are involved in the process of constantly expanding markets, expanding clinical indicators and expanding markets. 
that's fine. I mean, that's what profit-making corporations are supposed to do in a society um, that's a marketplace society. But to have them actually be the major drivers of health policy, which in fact I think they are, is uh, really astonishing and horrible for people like my family. Mm -hmm. My father did eventually, we, we failed completely to get the pacemaker turned off. You know, because I'm a journalist and a researcher, I eventually found out that that was possible. We didn't even know that was possible. We didn't know we had the moral right or the legal right to ask for it to be turned off. Um, but when we finally did, my mother and the, the car cardiologist said no. He told me that it would be like putting a pillow over my father's head. I think one of the most interesting things in the system is that the closer you are to the patient, the less power you have. And the further distant you are, the more power you have. So my mother and I, who were doing all the caregiving, had almost no power. The family doctor would have had a little bit more and the cardiologist who'd seen my father essentially twice um, had a great deal of power. My father finally died on a hospice unit of pneumonia, which my mother and I chose not to treat. Um, you know, made a very conscious decision. Finally got him into a palliative care program only about two months before he died. Um, it's, very, it's sometimes very difficult to get into these programs. Um, so that, that is sort of the sad part of the story my mother, on the other hand, after his death, she, here, here's, this is just because she's beautiful, I'm gonna show you. Yeah, this is her, she's probably in her like 60s here. But after, her after my father's death, she had two leaky heart valves, one which she'd had a long time. And I took her to Brigham and Women's, well, it's no longer Brigham, yeah, it's Brigham and Women's now, right. I took her to Brigham and Women's and, uh, because they have a really good reputation for late life heart surgery. We went in to the surgeon and, and the surgeon said to my mother, what are we here for? And she said to ask questions. And this yeah. was an absolute revolution <laughs> in her compared to where she was at at the moment that we walked into my, uh, to talk about my father's pacemaker and where she just went, oh, well, I guess we got to do it, and you know. So we talked about the risks of stroke and dementia. She said to the doctor, if I have a stro stroke, I want you to let me go. And she was on the edge of tears, and she put her hand on his um, hand. And he said, well, what about a little stroke, a minor stroke, just some weakness on one side? And then she also lifted up her pants leg, and she had an orange, DNR bracelet. She was Connecticut, you had to have uh, this orange hospital bracelet. And she said, I don't want to be revived if I die on the operating table. And of course, neither she nor I was that sophisticated at that time to realize that, you know, when you have open heart surgery, you're essentially killed and brought back to life. And so you, a, a DNR is in some way kind of a, I don't know, it's not really a fit, you know? <laughs> um, and he said, absolutely not. It would not be fair to our team we will have put a great deal of work into trying to keep you alive, and we won't do it. And a lot of times, and I'm sure there are people here who think, God, that's terrible, patient-centered care, they should get what they want. But we were actually very, I mean, in retrospect, I don't feel bad about that conversation at all, because he was honest. And I would much rather someone was honest than that once we were in there, and she did have a stroke, and she had a second stroke, and they revived her twice, and he would say, well, I just promised you that because I wanted to, you know, I thought surgery would be a good idea for her, you know. So I don't have any bad feelings about that. I felt that was very good um, patient-doctor conversation. And she came out, and they sent her up for one more test, and she came out, she put on her black coat, and she said, I will not do it. Five different cardiologists over the next five months tried to get her to change her mind. Five different teams at different points. I, I even got intimidated enough to call her and say, are you sure? The surgeon said you could live to be 90. She was 84 at this point. And she said, I don't want to live to be 90. Your father was my best friend. And I had to respect that. I mean, and then I cried and I said, I'm really gonna miss you. You're not only my mother, you're really a close friend of mine. I'm gonna miss you. And 
Then she had a heart attack. Oh, she cleaned out the basement? <laughs> she fixed a broken window. She said she was not leaving a mess for her kids. I mean, she had a lot of angina at this point. You know, she was in a lot of pain, and she was in heart failure, basically. And um, then she had a heart attack. She was taken to the hospital. Um, and I got called by yet another team of cardiologists who said they now wanted to do not only the two heart valves that she had rejected, but they also wanted to do a cabbage. And I just blew up. I just said, I just, and I was in, still in California, and she was in Connecticut. I sort of said, are you kidding? You want to do this now, now that she's already had a heart attack when she rejected it, when she, when she was in better, better shape? And I later found the research, which was that 13% of people her age who had those combined heart surgeries never die before they don't get out of the hospital. And another 40% end up in a nursing home. So statistically, it didn't even really make that much sense. And I called her up and said, I think we're grasping and at straws. And she said, it's hard to give up hope. And f four hours later, she called me back and she said, I want you to give my sewing machine to a woman who really sews. It's a Bernina. It's all metal. It has no plastic parts. And I said, but I would like your sewing machine. And she said, Katie, you do not sew, you know? <laughs> and she was able to really say, um, I'm ready to die. I'm at peace with all my children. And a month after that first heart attack, then I got her into hospice. And they didn't even want to let her into hospice then. They said, oh, she's still up, you know. I said, can I get my mother into hospice? They said, she's standing up and rearranging the flowers you sent her. She's fine, you know. She's nowhere near ready for hospice. And actually, then they gave her a cardiac catheterization, and, and I think it actually did harm her, because they were thinking about stents. It was another thing they were thinking about. So, um, and then she came back, and she was on hospice for a month, and then something happened. She probably had another heart attack, and they took her to the inpatient hospice unit, she had silver earrings on. She said, I want to take off my earrings. And they said, you don't have to take off your earrings. This is a hospice unit. And she said, I want to get rid of all the garbage. Mm -hmm. And I think that was her way of saying, naked we come into this world, and naked we will return. And then she sent my brother off to call me and my other brother uh, to tell, you know, because first she had said she was being taken care of by one of my brothers at that point. And when they first took her to the hospital for the second time, she said, don't call your siblings. They'll only panic and come. <laughs> you know? So she took off her earrings and told my brother to call us. And 20 minutes later, she was dead. And um, I was terribly upset that I was not there for her death. But given the options, I really feel she died the kind of death that she wanted to die. And she was that kind of person. She wasn't the kind of person who wanted to be taken care of by a relative for weeks or months or, or suffer with a very low quality of coping and life. And in a way, my father died way too slow. And in a way, my mother died way too fast for my taste. But I, I really do think we also need to get out of this sense that death is going to be perfectly timed. I, I, and this is, again, this thing that Don, or it was you, you were talking about, like the expectations, these unrealistic expectations people have of medicine. Like a lot of people want to, they want to live a great life. They want to be like right out of the AARP magazine, you know. They want to be running marathons at 80. And then they want to like really die suddenly. And they don't understand. They're, they're hitting a healthcare system where sudden death is almost outlawed. And the outrage that happens when someone dies at an assisted living place because no one did CPR and they were 88 and collapsed. I mean, these are the forces that people are struggling with. And they don't, nobody knows that the pathway to the kind of death you want is you have to be so thoughtful. You have to be so proactive because the default method is maximum treatment and maximum longevity unless you say very clearly otherwise. And um, anyway, so that's my family story. And I think it's so important to remember the many layers on top of that story, because the family's right here, and they're suffering. And they're suffering unnecessarily. 
and neither they nor necessarily the doctors know of these outer levels, like the level about the lobbying. I mean, in 2006, there was an attempt to improve payments for stroke care inside the hospital after a stroke, and the money was gonna be taken away from defibrillators, pacemakers, and one other major um, cardiac stents, I think, stents, okay? Advamed, which is the ad, um, advanced medical technology um, lobby, lobby uh, interest group, put on a $1 million campaign on, in, on, in Washington just about this one issue, these rollbacks. Uh, they had photo exhibits, they had Michael Deaver and Bonnie Blair and everybody who'd ever benefited from a medical device. Um, they, you know, had phonied up all these fake grassroots groups. They, they did a masterful job and those rollbacks never happened. And so these attempts to try to move this money from these fixes and cures at a point where curing is absolutely laughable and shift that money into care which is where we families need it, um, is really going to be an uphill battle. And that's why I really say it really does need a grassroots movement of really informed consumers, as well as whatever help those of you who are in healthcare now can give us. Thank you. How long did I go? Did I go too long? Probably. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. I can barely talk. I think I need to get up and call my mother and tell her I love her. <laughs> Which I'm going to do a break just because. Uh, <laughs> but Diane, do you want to? Um... Yeah. yeah um, I told a story last year that I think I'm going to have to tell again. Um, and I am preceded in telling a story twice by Don Berwick, so I guess it's OK. Um, Please. And, uh, it's a story of a, a patient of mine uh, who had advanced non-small cell lung cancer, was treated by an oncologist at a neighboring academic institution in New York City, who about 20 months before she died found me on the internet and came to see me because she recognized that her oncologist could not talk to her about what was going to happen when the treatments that he had so effectively given her for so long stopped working. And in fact, she at that point had lived five years after diagnosis of metastatic lung cancer, Jesse, um, and uh, far longer than any statistic would have predicted. Very skilled oncologist, and she had good quality of life working full time as a therapist, college age daughter, et cetera. So basically, she was terrified of what would happen and just wanted to talk about what's, what's it like to die? What's it like to die of lung cancer? What will you do if I can't breathe? What will you do if I'm in pain? Where will I be? Who's going to help my husband and my daughter? And you know, I could address those things you know, with great confidence. And then she was fine, because the anxiety was taken away. There would be a way to deal with it. And she and I and her oncologist worked together for the following 20 months taking care of her. Um, and then she, her brain met started growing to a point where she was having trouble remembering what her clients had said in therapy and losing the ability to concentrate. And she went to talk to her oncologist who said, um, offered her something called intrathecal chemotherapy, mm -hmm. which is putting a reservoir into the brain and infusing chemotherapy directly into the METs in the brain. And she left the office and called and came in to see me and said, what do you think I should do? Should I do this? Now, I'm not an oncologist. I'm a geriatrician and palliative care doc. And rather than reacting with, oh, that's completely ridiculous. Why would anyone suggest that, which was my impulse? Um, I kept my mouth shut. And I said, you know, I'm really not familiar with this procedure. I don't have any experience with it. But I'll call your oncologist. And we'll talk about it. One of us will get back to you. So I called him. And I said, you know, Judy was in today. and mentioned that you had recommended intrathecal chemotherapy for her brain mets. What are you hoping we can accomplish by doing this? And he, without missing a beat, said it won't help her. And again, I swallowed my cause. <laughs> Didn't leap through the phone to throttle him. And I took a deep breath, and he took a deep breath. And I said, well, do you want me to encourage her to go ahead with it? And he said, I don't want Judy to think I'm abandoning her. And I learned, that was like 50 years of learning in one second, right? He was not offering this treatment for money. He was not offering this treatment 
because he thought there was a one-tenth of one percent chance it would help. He was offering this treatment because he knew no other way to show how much he cared about her and how much he loved her because there was nothing else in his quiver because his education did not provide him with any other way to be present for her, to be a caring professional for her. We failed him in the medical education system. As soon as he said out loud, I don't want Judy to think I'm abandoning her, he became conscious, which he had not been before, of what drove that recommendation. He said, we're not gonna do that right away. And she went and, you know, he told her, and she went into hospice. She lived another three months or so. Um, I visited her at home. He never called her or saw her after that. And the week before she died, you know, I was asking, this is my common question, how are you feeling inside yourself? And she said, I'm really upset that my oncologist has not called and has not visited. So here's this woman nearing the end of her life. Her focus is not on her daughter or her husband. Her focus is on abandonment by her oncologist and feeling so hurt and so rejected and so diminished in value because someone who had, she had been so close to and had worked so hard with her for so many years seemed to zero her out. And, you know, I know that he didn't call or visit because he felt like he couldn't help, right? And he you know, didn't want to be reminded of helplessness. But I asked her permission to call him. And he, he said, when I said, she wants to see you, he said, why? There's nothing I can do for her. Mm. And I said, she wants to say goodbye. She wants to say thank you. She wants to tell you she loves you. She's really grateful to you. He made his first home visit. Mm. She died a couple days later. Um, and by the way, he worked 10 blocks from where she lived. It wasn't even a hassle to go visit her. This is a failure of medical education and role modeling. And the same with the, the cardiologist who gave your father the pacemaker. This is what he or she was trained to do. Mm -hmm. And that's all they were trained to do. And you can't blame people for practicing as they are trained. Okay, so that's the first thing. How about the calf before she goes into hospice? I mean, it's just the same, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, hard to know. You know, maybe they thought that with a stent they could eliminate the angina. And the angina was a serious quality of life issue. I can see where, how that mm -hmm. happened. And I could even see agreeing with it, you know, depending on how much heart failure she was also in. So anyway, that we don't have, we're not privy to those details. I'm not sure it was an unreasonable mm -hmm. procedure if there was a lot of pain from, from ischemia that could have been relieved. So then the second piece is what are we going to do when the device manufacturers are controlling everything that is happening to all of us. Because the bottom line is it's not the doctor's fault, it's not the hospital administrator's fault, it's unfettered capitalism um, and campaign, lack of campaign finance reform. And I, it's, I think it's very important to name the, the problem because otherwise we're going to spend a lot, waste a lot of time and energy on solutions that will have no impact. Because until that is fixed, we're not going to have politicians who are able to counter that kind of democratically imposed lobbying power. That's democracy at work. Them who has the knowledge of how democracy works, lobby. The rest of us go to work every day and wonder why our government is so messed up. So what, my point about that is that we have to have public awareness and public demand. The only thing that I believe can counter all that money is public awareness and public demand. The most important, because politicians depend on people to vote for them. And if there is very strong public demand to Congress, because we mobilize that movement and we create that positive vision of the good so people understand that they are getting screwed and that it doesn't have to be that way and that it can be better, that they have a vision of what could be because we have the tyranny of low expectations for our healthcare system now, that it has to be fragmented and it has to be impersonal and it has to not meet family and patients' needs because that's just the way it is. No one knows it doesn't have to be that way. We have to create that vision. We have to get people really mad 
we have to help them express that to their elected representatives. Otherwise, nothing is going to change because we will never have the money that people who are, um, I, I guess as Don said, the, the shunt of money out of the healthcare system to people who are profiting a great deal from it. And that we're not gonna, we can't counter that with money. We don't have the money. We have to counter it with a really strong political movement and we have to organize. Um, so that's what I'm hoping will come out of this meeting. Not pointing fingers at doctors, not, you know, everyone is kind of a victim of a system that is designed to, to, to deliver exactly the product that we're getting. And we, we've got to fight it politically. It's the only way to fight it. Um, we have a lot of people standing up over on time. I just wanted a quick response from Australian perspective and as an oncologist to the story you heard. Do you have anything? Uh... In, in Australia, we are a little bit more fortunate with, uh, in terms of palliative care in that oncology and palliative care services coexist and there has been a greater uptake of palliative care. The problem, however, however, lies within oncologists who will still not refer to palliative care because they consider it a, a failure on their part to care for the patient. And so we face, in some ways, the, the same issues in that um, oncologists will, will keep over-treating or will dismiss palliative care uh, we'll talk down palliative care sometimes, but I think overall uh, the community response to palliative care and the com uh, has, has been great. And I think I, I really agree with your point about raising awareness because even if now a doctor doesn't necessarily introduce a patient to palliative care, patients come in and say, my neighbor has had palliative care, grandpa had palliative care, it looks good. You know, it did him. You know, it did him a good service. You know, how do I get on to palliative care? So I, I think you know what I'm seeing is that there is a much broader community acceptance of, of palliative care, and I hope that things go the same way here because it really does benefit patients. So let's. Um, and palliative care is not end of life care. It's, it's a broader concept that people right. don't often understand. Let, I'm just going to go back and forth and try to keep your comments short, and we'll. Uh, if we're going to stay with the people who are up now. And then we'll close. So let's see if we can go quickly and give everyone a chance to say something. Hi, my name is Bart Windrum, and due to brevity, I won't be able to give you the backstory. But I am a lay person, and after experiencing each of my parents' very crummy three week terminal hospitalizations, I was motivated to end up here over about a decade's worth of time. And uh, during that, work, that time, I've tried to answer two key questions for myself because I never want to experience what we experienced with my parents. I've run out of parents to fail with. Yeah. And the questions were, why do we fail to die in peace? And what must each of us do to increase our likelihood of dying in peace? And I focus on the practical obstacles to them. So I just want to share a couple of thoughts that feel relevant to me. One is to introduce uh, a goal here in the conference about dealing with the moral and ethical aspect and the spiritual aspect of these issues that we face. And from my experience and pondering, the failure to disclose fully and in enough time for the patient family to engage with the information and come to choice points is unethical and immoral. We cannot have, we cannot give informed consent if we have not received full disclosure. The second is a thought process that I went through at the beginning of this after mom and dad died and I had to pick it apart, I had to tease it apart. Why did we fail? And I wound up redefining what it is that we received. This was square one for me in like 2005. And I, and I realized that we lost the first week of these terminal hospitalizations, which each, la each lasted three weeks, the average, to confusion and disarray, not believing what was happening, what believing, not believing what wasn't happening. And I realized that we were not experiencing or receiving care. And care is a funny word, and I, don't, I hope I don't alienate anyone here today, but I don't accept that word anymore until I experience it. And I had to redefine what it is that we experienced in hospital. And here's my definition, that medicine provides bodily repair services, 
under the direction of independent physician scientists and nurse monitoring on some schedule. That's what we experienced. And I don't say that to piss anybody off. I, I said it to myself because I had to prepare myself for the next time, which still scares me to the bone. All right, so I wanted to just throw those thoughts out into the mix. They're certainly relevant to the context here. Terrific, thank you. I'm just going to let them. John Nance, uh, Orca Institute. There's so many thoughts. I'll just be as brief as I possibly can. Uh, a couple of things here. First of all, medical school is absolutely got to be one of our main focal points. We've got to change the way we teach people to communicate. We have to change the way we decide who is going to be the best candidate for a doctor. And I say that with some fear and trepidation with all the physicians in the room because you were selected by the current system. But having undergone an awakening mutually here, I think you'll agree with me, we've got to look for something other than just the type AAA personalities who can beat anybody at, at anything. We've got to look for empathy. Secondly, we talk about, and I use this phrase in my lectures all the time, a physician-centric system. Uh, I think that may be a little unfair, and I'm going to change my lexicon. I think it should be a provider-centric system. Whether it's physician-centric or uh, provider-centric, and you made this uh, point yourself, Harlan, Everything is centered around what's best for the provider, what's best for the doctor, not what's best for the patient. I use the phrase patient-centric instead of centered to try to get to the point that the definition is really very simple, and I'd like to kind of instill this into everybody's thinking. A patient-centric system is one in which everything, everything is subordinate to the best interests of the patient as determined by the patient and the patient's family. We are light years from that now, as everybody has, has said and pointed out here. And, um, and finally, I, just one comment. I think the, uh, the thing that you were talking about in regard to the capitalist system, our biggest problem is that we need to redefine what a public utility is. This is the number one public utility in the United States. I'm the only one to say in this. I'm a lawyer. But it really is extant to me that we need to talk about it because a public utility by its very essence in a free society is something that cannot be allowed to be blown in the wind of the vicissitudes of the free market. It doesn't mean we take it over. It doesn't mean we nationalize it. It does mean that we look at the things that it can't do for itself. And there is nothing more important to the body politic of this country, 318 million of us, than health care. That is a public utility. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. So to remark on, uh, Dave Newman from New York. So to remark on uh, one thing centrally, if, first of all, if you haven't read Katie Butler's book, you must. It is brilliant. It goes by too fast. It is poignant. It's funny. It's wonderful. And I'm going to quote from it because uh, one What's of the called? things, there's, I'm sorry? What's it called? What's the name? Your book, Knocking on Heaven's Door? I'm sorry, Knocking on Heaven's Door. <laughs> Scribner, tell me what press. Scribner, 2013, is that right, Scribner? Yeah. Okay. Nan Graham, was it? Um, so uh, I'm going to quote from it because there are so many great phrases in it that crystallize um, things for me. Um, and one of them was uh, this, when you're describing your father, uh, you know, this brilliant man, fully functional, independent, incredible intellect, uh, and, you know, in the early days after his stroke, he's in the hospital, and y'all are there around him, and you describe him as um, catheterized and naked beneath a pale hospital gown, a member of the classless fraternity of the stricken. The classless fraternity of the stricken. And it crystallized a number of things for me, the classless fraternity of the stricken. And I bring it up now because we're talking about um, medical education and trying to, you know, figure out how to adjust our worldview. One of the things that I think we don't recognize in our own worldview is that we have an other and we have a self. We have, you know, as the physicians and providers, we have self and we have other. And other is the classless fraternity of the stricken. Mm -hmm. And I have learned a lot um, about communication, watching palliative care doctors, watching Diane just today, um, if, if y'all noticed, I'm sure you noticed that instantly the first thing Diane got to say, she gravitated right to Jesse. She went straight to Jesse and started talking to Jesse. And when she spoke to Jesse, you wouldn't have known that that was a classless fraternity of the stricken person. 
you would never have known. The way she spoke, it could have been anybody on the panel, it could have been any physician, it could have been, and uh, my wife is a palliative care physician as well who trained under Diane, and I'm gonna just do an impression of what she looks like walking to, she's also an emergency physician, and when she walks up to a bed in the emergency department to say hello to a patient who she's just meeting for the first time, here's my impression of, she would kill me, by the way, kill me. <laughs> If she, if she knew I was doing this. But my impression of her, she sort of has this southern way about her. It's just her, her nature. She walks up to the foot of the bed and she says, hello. That's how she says hi. And, it's, and I've watched it so many times and what's brilliant about it is that it, there's like a moment in there where she and that person have a secret. That's almost what it's like. It's like they're partnering, it's they're together. They really are, you know, they're on the same mission they have the same goal, and there is no classless fraternity of the stricken in that moment. And so I think that's what everybody's looking for in their doctor. I think they're looking for somebody who doesn't see them as a, you know, a member of that fraternity. Somebody who can make decisions, and when we talk about why can you make a decision you know, in a paternalistic way or not make a decision, and how do you find that flexibility, it's really about whether you're partnering with that patient whether you two are members of the same fraternity instead of different ones. Because if you're members of the same fraternity, you don't mind them making a decision for you. That's great. They know that you have their goals in mind. And so uh, I wanted to bring that up because that phrase helped me to understand how we uh, you know, sort of divided and have moved apart um, and how we might start thinking about moving back together. Hi, I'm Carol Casella from Seattle. I'm a physician and also a writer, and uh, he stole my opening line because I wanted to say that Katie Butler's book was just extraordinarily moving and so beautifully written, and I do highly recommend Knocking on Heaven's Door. I also wanted to add to Diane's statement that as the Do ACA you know developed, <laughs> we're all on the payroll, no, but as the ACA developed, they actually removed language that would have allowed negotiation between Medicare and the device companies, and it's just pitiful. But um, what I really wanted to mention was, as a physician, I think many of us have seen that you have the patient who comes in uh, with a broken hip, you fix the hip, then they develop pneumonia, you fix the pneumonia, then they get a little septic, and so they go into temporary renal failure, and you think, well, dialysis might get them through this, and in retrospect, we can look back and say we should have stopped here, we should have stopped there, but we don't have that retrospect, of course. And one of the consequences that we're facing now is that because we have saved so many people from their car accidents and their ALL, we have now a body of aging people who will need more and more of these critical decisions made. Um, one of the other books I recently read was the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, which I think for this audience would be really a, a great value. It is not the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the weird one, <laughs> but it's, it's really about modern hospice care and an approach to dying. And the question that it raises for me and that I'd like to address to everyone here is, in the Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, death is something that one begins preparing for from the moment they are born. And we have forgotten, I think, in this culture to look at life as a circle. And perhaps this conversation about death needs to begin even much earlier than when we are in our 60s. And I don't know if other people have experience from other cultures that could speak to that. I think it's an innate human thing to fear death, but I'd love to hear the conversation. Uh, uh, can I say something here? Okay. Um, we did have a tradition called The Art of Dying, Ars Moriendi, starting in about 1450, the mo they were best-selling books about how to behave at your deathbed and how to behave as you're surrounding the deathbed. And various forms of these traditions through the Quakers had a book called Piety Promoted that was a bestseller among the Quakers for like over 100 years. And it was nothing but accounts of, you know, uh, mm. spiritually advanced deathbeds. And there were certain virtues that you practiced on your deathbed, such as acceptance, you know. Um, there were, there was a whole, we had a whole tradition and we had total amnesia about it at the point where all of this life saving was invented mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s and, and dying was medicalized and unfortunately we understood dying as an experience that required ministry 
prior, the, the problems were emotional and spiritual. They were not practical and physical. And that when it moved into the hospital, that need for ministry really dropped out of the experience. So families come in and they're really, a lot of them are seeking some form of ministry and the only people they have to turn to are people who are experts in a single organ. Mm -hmm. So I think we could revive a Western tradition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Phil Caper and I've uh, been a long time health policy uh, trying to be a practitioner. The last few years I've turned my attention to educa educating and, and organizing the public around these issues. By, I write a regular column in the Bangor Daily News, healthcare advice column for, for lay people. Uh, feel free to Google my name and the columns will come up. You might find them interesting. When I was in medical school, I was taught the great physician is not the one who recognizes the signs and the symptoms of a disease. Anybody can do that. It's the person who is able to recognize the underlying pathology and therefore formulate a prescription that attacks the base problem. And that's what I've tried to do. I had heard nothing much about what I consider to be the underlying pathology. Uh, Overutilization to me is just a sign or a symptom. Uh, until Katie and Diane got up and spoke about the role of capitalism run amok. Don Berwick suggested that physicians set the tone and the expectations of the public. That may have been true 50 years ago, but folks, I gotta tell you, we physicians are bit players in this drama these days. It's being run and driven by the large profit-seeking corporations. There's a sociologic concept that that silence is consent. Silence is consent. My question is what's the appropriate role for physicians in taking back a profession I believe has been hijacked, to use John Guyman's term, uh, by large for-profit organizations, nowhere more so than in the United States. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Cresson. I'm a PhD health services researcher from here in Boston at Boston University and the VA. And I've been uh, struck and I wanna commend you all, especially those of you who are patients and Jesse who's not in the room on the courage in telling your stories. And I have stories I could tell you. I bet we all could tell stories to one another, but it strikes me there's a small amount of danger in the individual anecdote, which can potentially be marginalized as a single person's experience, although if we all come together and tell our stories, maybe that will be a basis for political uh, connection and movement. But I also, I guess I wanna encourage us all to think about the systems behind our stories because that's how we're gonna get to Friday and moving forward in this world. And the second comment I wanted to make to Becky and others about this business of having a plan. Um, I, I find that concept a little problematic in a way, and I wrote about this in a JAMA piece of my mind piece earlier this year where even if you have a plan and you go as a patient in to see your doctor or whatever provider, it, at that moment it becomes you and the provider. The plan may or may not go out the window, but there you are alone. And I think something happens in that moment in terms of deference to the more highly trained clinician to a field that you may have done extensive research about, but something happens. And I think we have to remember that because you don't go into the room with your army of compadres. And I guess the final observation I'd make, and again back to Becky's story, was it was sad to me to sort of hear that the end of your story was a bit about how you're not going to go to the hospital the next time, that you're gonna go someplace and see a practitioner maybe who won't do those things to you. And Harlan made the point earlier about what's our narrative gonna be, and I think we have to think about this because I don't think we want the narrative to end with, I'm not going to the doctor. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Do you mind if I just respond to that quickly? Uh, I, I don't want the takeaway for, from that to be that I won't go to the doctor. It's about finding a provider who will listen to me and will respect me 
And in this case, the only place in which I can find that is at a birth center where the VBAC success rate is 98% versus the 10% overall for this country. And that's, in a way, for me, protecting myself. And a physician actually does work with this birth center. That's the only way they can actually get licensed. And that physician, she actually, when I first called the birth center to get an appointment, she picked up the phone and said, can I help you? And I said, yes, I'd like to talk about um, possibly becoming a patient and becoming a VBAC patient. Oh, well, this is Dr. So-and-so. How can I help you? Um, that never happens. <laughs> and her first comment to me, can you tell me a little bit about what happened? And I told her, maybe a sentence. I was induced, post-dates, big baby, or presumed big baby, which she was only eight pounds, six ounces. So I never ended with that. Um, and she said, you know, and I said, and the end section was, you know, the reason for the section was failure to progress. She goes, that's no longer going to be an allowed reason, and I'm so sorry that happened to you. How can we help you? And that's the reason that I'm not going back to the hospital, because the ho it's not the hospital, it's the care that I can receive there. Gordy Schiff, I'm an internist in Boston. Um, I want to try and make two points briefly, although before I do, I can't help but notice. So I, we heard someone say we've almost outlawed sudden death in this society. Um, the Lown Institute, uh, I worship Bernard Lown as a student and still do in many ways. It'd be interesting to hear how he helps us put that together, but that was his career was devoted to outlawing sudden death or attacking sudden death. So there's an irony there that I think it's important to acknowledge as we're staring at that uh, red poster in, in, the, in the conference. Um, the, the, one, the two points I want to make, first is epitomized by, I think, one of my favorite uh, Simpsons cartoons that I used to watch with my kids, where Mr. Burns, the evil, greedy uh, nuclear plant operator, finds Homer Simpson on a ventilator. I don't, I don't know how that happened. And he comes in, he says, you need death with dignity. We can't afford this anymore. And he pulls the plug. <laughs> and I, 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 I want to just say, obviously, we're not tr talking about being, uh, you know, the Mr. Burns, but we have to be aware of sort of burn, uh, palliative, Burns and paleo clothing, Mr. Burns and pa paleo clothing. Um, we, we, we hear a lot, I, I think one of the real beauties of the Choose Wisely campaign was from consumers and professionals. It was not led by the insurance companies. Phil Caper talked about some of the, the, the forces in healthcare that are driving us in the wrong direction. We, we have to add them as well. So we have to be, and, and th this whole idea about how we're going to solve healthcare costs is by putting physicians at risk. Um, you know, this managed care 2.0, I'm in a hospital where we're being at risk. So you tell somebody they don't need something. And uh, by the way, full disclosure, I'm, I make a few hundred dollars if I deny this test to you, if I'm at risk. Okay? How, how does that play out? So we have to move away from this marketplace, doctors at risk, solutions, we, we, I think we need a single payer plan where if you're really talking about cost containment, the cost, the, the money you save is contained in the system or it goes to public other resources. It doesn't go to somebody's yacht, or, I mean, or, or me as a doctor paying for my college ed, kids' college education. So, so that's number one. And then the second one kept coming up over and over this idea about, you know, you take, you give people this menu of choices. You take chemotherapy or you're on your own. Again, and I'm being very uh, oversimplifying here. But I think th there's a real problem of us uh, offering these menus of choices and letting people sort of be on their own with the sort of conservative approach with, with an atrophy of what we as physicians, we as healthcare providers uh, do in terms of our repertoire of helping people. We have to figure out how to be uh, supportive, Go the, go the mile with the patient, be there for the patient, and actually even advocate for new alternatives of what these conservative approaches are. So I think when we sort of define these alternatives, that's fine and give people choices. Um, and, and you can do everything with us, the medical system, or you're on your own. We, we really have to think about how conservative, a more conservative and appropriate and care, I would say caring and supportive uh, role looks and it's highly atrophied, and, and me as a physician, mo most of my colleagues don't know how to do that well enough, and we're not being trained to do that. Mm -hmm. yep. La last comment, sorry. I think I'm keeping people from lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my name's Jim McGee, and I represent uh, probably an atypical constituency. 
Uh, I uh, uh, run a benefit plan that provides the health care benefits for the 11,000 bus and subway operators in D.C. And I was hoping that the panel could comment on an article in this Saturday's Washington Post in, of all places, the faith section. And they uh, made the observation that in the minority community, which doesn't appear to be too well represented in this room, and speaking of African Americans and Hispanics, that they have a uh, much higher likelihood to use maximum end-of-life resources. And they cited basically three reasons. One, a historical uh, um, denial of care, and, and now they have the opportunity to access care. Two, it challenges their faith that God can fix it. And three, there was a quote in the story that I thought was particularly revealing. And, and, and Diane uh, used the term uh, suffering in, 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 in hospital end of life care. She said, suffering? Suffering is not being able to feed your kids. Being in a hospital bed is not suffering. Hmm. And I was wondering if you could uh, comment. Um, anyway. Yeah, I have one thought about it, which is this, the fact that we have half the pop, you know, a, a large section of people who are undertreated, and then, and then once you hit 65, you really are in danger of being overtreated. That in the case of the minority community, people are, because they've been undertreated and they have not had good health care, they're less likely to have meaningful relationships with doctors that they trust. And so then, if you end up in the hospital, um, I think that makes these end of life kind of decisions harder. And then the obvious thing, which is, in a healthcare system that created the Tuskegee experiment and Henrietta Lacks, to then suddenly expect people to be trusting at the end of life when someone says, we don't think putting your mom on a ventilator is appropriate, is a really, really, it's a difficult sell. And John, last, unless Diane, do you have some? some uh, I, it's, I don't want to keep people from lunch. I could talk for so, yeah. so very quickly, I work mm. in a, my hospital uh, where it's located. We probably have about 100 different nationalities who come to us. And I constantly find that if communication with the average patient is bad, communication with a non-English speaking migrant population with different expectations and cultural nuances is just terrible. And I think that has a lot to do with disparity in care, disparity in expectations, and hence the kind of care people receive. Thanks, well, I'm gonna hand it back to you guys. I want to personally thank everyone. Well, just an extraordinary. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of the audience, I want to thank you, Harlan, and all of you, and Jessie's not with us. She's gone to her chemotherapy appointment uh, for an extraordinary session. Thank you. It's everything we hoped it would be, and there's a lot more to talk about. Before you go to lunch, where's Lena Wen? Stand up, Lena. Stand up. Lena Wen is uh, going to be outside. Stand up again. Come on, please. There, there. Uh, she's going to be outside, and anybody who'd like to film a statement about what they think is relevant in terms of the appropriate care, the right care, or another angle would be uh, capturing the wisdom of a mentor you had in medicine or elsewhere. We're collecting these, and we're going to post them online eventually. So they'll be right in the corner as you go out, and you can sign up. Ladies and gentlemen, please proceed.